Parks and Recreation Advisory Board meeting. We have quorum present. We'll uh, begin with approved agenda. We'll entertain a motion to approve. We had a recommendation for an additional discussion. Okay, uh, is there any discussion of that? Is that okay to add to the action board? As always. We'll be reaching out to them to talk about the onboarding we do as far as providing them information, but you all have a, an onboarding process of your own. That City Council, April 4th. Very procedural and where they talk about how to work well together and efficiently. And then Thursday is where they will talk about their work plan. And so Agenda, they will have their second reading and the public hearing. For Other than that, just note that the next few months are all budget all the time. As our friend Stacy says, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, and we're going to be. help just facilitate the conversation and we're always open to your input on how to best support you in those test on the room and we are getting audio so maybe we project our voice towards the big speakers here And so if anyone has joined the Zoom from their computer, we need to make sure they're on mute. Rosa, your computer should be on mute because this is, well, does that matter? So, um, and, and we're seeing that this one's lighting up right now, so people can hear me right now, but I'm seeing only this one light up and I'm only seeing it. I don't know. That is what I meant. Charlotte is on the issue. Beardy, um, thank you for being our, our technology. Both who are with way. us virtually, thank you for helping us test this solution. All right, we've changed microphones and now we're testing how well you all hear us. Can you hear us okay? All right. Go to the project. Look okay. at that. Thanks so much, everybody. Rosa, you may want to move your computer to the edge of your desk so it's a little more sensitive to the room. Hey, team. All right. Okay. <laughs> Next up is public participation. 
And this portion of the meeting is for members of the public to communicate ideas or concerns to the board regarding parks and recreation issues for which a public hearing is not scheduled later in the meeting. And there are no uh, public hearing items, so all public comment will be taken out. Public is encouraged to comment on the need for parks and recreation programs and facilities as they perceive them. All speakers are limited to three minutes. Depending on the nature of your matter, you may or may not receive a response from the board after you deliver your comments. Rest assured, the board and staff are always listening and we appreciate the feedback. So I believe we have uh, one person on the line who's going to be providing a comment. That is Randy Bear. Uh, he sent us an email earlier, uh, that was forwarded by Rosa, that had a PDF showing a number of signatures on uh, on a uh, what do you call it? petition. Thank you. Um, so, Randy, if you're able to unmute and begin speaking, you'll have three minutes. Okay, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, perfect. Hi, my name is Randy Bear. I'd like to thank you for allowing me to speak before the board. Though I'm here alone, I bring with me the voices and concerns of hundreds and hundreds of people. We want to request that the Stone Heart slash Dog Memorial at Coot Lake is allowed to stay how and where it is. The heart has been here for over 15 years and I've heard nothing but total support for it. How much people enjoy it and love the beautiful message it represents. Some are reminded of friends and family who have passed. Others associate it with the love of the land, a connection to this wonder place, wonderful place we all enjoy. Some just a simple notion to have more love in our hearts. And for those of us who have walked here with a beloved pet that we've had to say goodbye to, it's a tangible connection to that lost companion place where we reminisce and feel a closeness with the spirit of our departed friend, a place of comfort and healing. I know Regina had concerns that it didn't fit in the natural setting or that people may object to it. Um, not the case. Every one of the hundreds of people I've talked to love it and want very much for it to stay. It's also very inconspicuous as your Mr. Thornton claimed that it was only noticed just this last year. Both Regina and Mr. Thornton have said that they've never received even one complaint about the heart. Regina was also concerned with maintenance and her crew's ability to do their jobs. The heart is out of the way and sits in a grass field that isn't maintained. I've maintained the area for years by myself and now I've been joined by several others. We clean the weeds, pick up dog poop and trash, not only here, but throughout the entire area. We have a sense of community and want to keep one of our favorite areas looking pristine and we will continue to do so. The heart is a unique concept that so many people respect and appreciate, kind of a bolder thing. I can't guess the number of people over the years I've seen taking pictures of toddlers, puppies, whole groups in or around the heart, and I hear comments of how cool they think it is, kind of a bolder thing. You can see the joy on their faces. I'm asked why they would want it to destroy this beautiful and positive symbol. We all wonder, with all the negativity and darkness in our world, the murders and mass shootings, racial and political division and so on, why would they want to remove a beacon of light? A beautifully simple stone symbol that represents love and reminds us of departed souls. An idea that unites a community rather than dividing it. This is something that has harmed or bothered no one, but just the opposite has provided so much joy and comfort to so many people over the years. We ask that you please allow our heart to remain as it has been for such a long time and consider the positive effect and goodwill resulting from the heart remaining as opposed to the upset, confused, angry, and hurtful people if the heart is removed. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, your comment. Is there anyone else who's uh... Signed up for public comment, Rosa? That was official. The, uh, Randy Barr was officially signed up. We have. And then we have Nancy J and Lynn Siegel. Okay. Uh, is it okay to hear from these additional community members? Okay. Then please go ahead and allow the next person to speak for three minutes. Thank you. Lynn, uh, yeah, now. this is not the middle person. This is Lynn Siegel. And um, uh, do you not make it so that I have to sign up ahead of time anymore? Did you change your policy? We do have sign up, um, pre-sign up uh, on our PRAB page. But I was under the under, you're the only board that does that, except okay. for city council. 
And so I was under the impression that if you didn't sign up that way, then you couldn't speak. Lynn, you're being allowed to speak, and so your timer will start in five seconds. Are you ready? I'm asking a question. Please yeah. answer it. If you'd like to use your time that way, we can. We yep. can also follow up with you. Yep. All. Yep. We'll start your timer. Just answer the question, please. So, to my knowledge, we we are intending to change the policy, but to my knowledge, it has not been changed yet. We're trying to make the policy the same across all boards. So it'll be simpler for people to sign up to speak. Hallelujah. I've been whining about this for decades. And this is how long it takes for change to happen in Boulder. But you know what? From now on, you better watch out because in Denver, they're cutting recreation center hours. They're cutting all kinds of public services. And you guys need to be at the planning board and at the, the boards that really control the economics of the city because you're at the tail end and I don't want my rec hour centers cut. So do something about it. And this is, this is big because there is a housing crisis and there's an economic reality in this city that no one wants to face. No one in city government and they better because I won't put up with my rec center hours going down and I never even use the rec center. Done. Thank you very much. And uh, we had another speaker, Rosa, is that right? Nancy, are you here for public participation? Um, you know, I'm not. I just uh, was here to listen. So, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't you sign. You unmuted the wrong person. Oh, shoot. Okay. okay. Here we go. Yeah, I, I had just c come on to listen tonight. Um, I hadn't tried to sign up for any time to speak. That's all right. Thank you, Nancy. Thank well, you, you. You got a few seconds anyway, didn't you? Well, I will. You know, we have six generations, soon to be seven generations of our family in Boulder. So Great. we've all seen a lot of changes and um, we still love it. And Really, I'm just here to listen. the The dog memorial thing is near and dear to me too, though. Um, just little pebbles. It's basically stones that people have laid in a heart shape on the ground. And uh, when I heard that was that was an issue, I did want to tune in just to listen. So thank you. I appreciate you all being here. Thank, thank you, you, Nancy. Um, so this is an opportunity for members of the board to request response from staff or. Make your own comments. Yeah, what's can I what's your response to the the pet memorial? Sure. Um one, we did send the board some information on Friday. I was a little um saddened to see the way the story was portrayed yesterday in the daily camera because I think it left out everything that our staff has done since January when the memorial was initially removed. But first I just want to say for Mr. Bear, um I am a pet owner myself. My dog is very precious to me. And if something happened, I can understand the interest for Memorial. And I agree that Coot Lake is a magical, gorgeous spot. I can walk there with my dog Saturday morning. Um, and our team has been in contact with several of these community members since Saturday. We just alerted, sorry, since January, we just learned of Mr. Bear's interest and involvement and petition when he submitted that on Thursday. And Regina's already spent time talking to him. Um, and I, I hear all of the interests and reasons for a pet memorial, and we're very open to figuring that out. It has to be balanced with protecting public lands, which is maybe one of the most important and least fun parts of our job. It's similar to managing encroachments. It's not fun. but um, And I'm just going to point out two reasons why that were actually also covered in the Daily Camera article. One is just size. Mr. Bear mentions in the article that this that he believes this was less than a foot when he began it at whatever point that was, and now it's significantly larger. And so without some kind of management and control, who knows what something like this would become, and it does need to coexist with the natural setting, with maintenance practices. But the third is, um, in the article mentioned, the social media impact. And this is something that we're seeing on public lands all over the country, that as folks find spots and take pictures and post them, then they become heavily impacted by a visitation that is abnormal or copycat behavior. And so we're not saying no to a pet memorial, but it does need to happen in partnership with the department and we're having those conversations. I have a question. Um, I know that there's some question to how long this 
yeah. more was in place. Um, some people say 15 years, maybe just a little bit less than that. But why now did this suddenly become an issue? I, I so and I I just realized I'm sorry you asked me about the time and I forgot to get back to you. We don't know. Um, our team does not believe it's been 15 years. We we have a pretty regular presence on that land, if not daily, it's certainly weekly, and we're in and out of the land more so than the public because we get the protected areas. Um, it became much more noticeable, and again, the growth due to the size in the last several months in January, the decision was. The other thing I want to say out loud is, is a learning we've had through this. Well, yes, we have to protect public lands. We know there's a lot of motion involved with this pet memorial and 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 could have communicated differently, whereas you know we, we kept the rocks and got them to people um, I think when, if we were to be faced with a similar situation, we probably would have done proactive communication and tried to connect with folks and try to organize something. So uh, can you just talk to us a little bit about what the process might be for approving a formal pet memorial in some future time and place? Yeah, that's a good question. There isn't one because we've never done it before. But I'm thinking of typical processes. We would work with the team similar to how we do um, the public art process, I think it would mirror that the way. Is the design compatible with maintenance standards? What is its long time upkeep care? Who is involved with it? What does that look like? And we would we we can follow that process, modify it for this use. I'm gonna make a suggestion. Take a lead it. Sure. Let's find a place where there's a need for a paved path of some kind and let's pave it pavers and then give people the opportunity to buy a stone with their pets name written on it. That's a great suggestion. Maybe a partnership with the Humane Society. I'll pass it to the team because again, this is the community interest. The other thing I'll just share that has come up is there an, is there is interest for a child memorial somewhere in our system for people who've lost a child. Um, and so this is something that we know people use public spaces and, and certainly natural lands to memorialize folks. And so I hear the suggestion and I'll certainly pass it along. And I and I hope I'm not sure if Mr. Bear is connected with some of these other um, community members, but uh, I'll follow up with Gina and make sure that. Idea that's possible. Last thing, I'm sorry to have a lot of questions on this, but um, the Daily Kramer article made it seem like we're now in this tug of war with individuals and they're putting the stones back and they're being removed and they're being replaced. Did that actually happen? I don't know. I have to get back to you. Okay. That was a quote from the story. Yeah. Book, yeah. We're removing the stones, they're being put back, we're removing them again. That seems like a, a not, big, fun. not fun. Not fun. Not a good use of our resources. Yeah. I'll have to follow up. I don't know. Thanks. So I have appreciated your comment or the issue of um, social media having a way of uh, expanding these kinds of memorials and having them replicated elsewhere. And I can see how that could be problematic. But I also think that there's, you know, I work for a large bureaucracy. It's called the federal government. And there's a tendency for a fairly bureaucratic reaction to uh, rules not being followed. And one example is ghost bike memorials. When a cyclist dies on a road, it, uh, it's common for people to put up a white painted bike at the location of their crash, decorate it with their names and flowers, and put it up there as a memorial. And then there's this tug of war that develops between the relevant transportation agency and the cycling community who are removing the bike, and then a new one gets put up with more flowers, and there's a back and forth. It goes on, and I've always been on the side of the uh, the ghost bikes, frankly, having put more than one up myself. So I can really appreciate the community members' desire for an ad hoc sort of from the heart mm -hmm. community developed kind of memorial like this, as opposed to here here's a place where you can build a memorial and it has to meet these specifications, and you know. So I guess I'd like to ask for there to be as much leniency as there can be, you know, as is as, as, as reasonable in the face of this issue with social media and the potential for expanding to places where it really would cause damage. This particular location doesn't seem damaging to me. It's right on the edge. It's a very heavily traveled area. It's right on the edge of a, you know, a park bench seating area that's basically bare dirt. And you know, it seems like if you're going to put a, a place for a memorial like this that is going to have minimum impact, that's the kind of place you would choose. And so I guess I, I guess I, I just would appreciate having a, a light hand and a light touch on this issue to the extent that it's feasible with your policies. No. 
Any further comments from the board? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for the public comment. We will move on to the consent agenda, starting with approval of the minutes from the last meeting. I have a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Uh, I just have one comment on the minutes. Let's second, and then we'll, we'll discuss. Okay, second. Okay, great. Is there any discussion on the minutes? There is one thing where the public comment about the plan for the Pleasant View, and it said, like, is there going to be, what's going to be done at the entrance so it's not used as an entrance? So I just thought that that was confusing terminology and it didn't represent what uh, I said. I see the book. How are we going to engineer the entrance to connect Palmia in such a way that people don't use it as an entrance? We can reword that for clarification. Okay. So I have a motion to approve the agenda and an amendment to it. Um, all in favor of approving the agenda as amended? Aye. Okay. Okay, then we uh, had the updates from the director, uh, the operations updates, and the planning, design, and construction updates that were in the packet. Are there any comments or questions from the board on those topics? Well, as always, I have some. So, um, Arts in the Park, that is uh, under the operations update, included a ballet symphony opera. And I wonder if there's an opportunity here for more culturally diverse offerings. These are very Eurocentric, shall we say. Um, for example, Latin American dance with music. And I actually have the same questions for bands on the bricks, which seemed uh, to attract a certain demographic, which I fit even in. Um, and I wonder if there might be an opportunity to expand the diversity of offerings so that we can bring in people who might appreciate that diversity. I think Brian Beery is in the meeting, and I think he can speak to Arts in the Park and an exciting press release that went out on Friday. I sure can. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfectly. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, Brian Beery, Community Building and Partnerships. Um, it's a great segue and, and uh, opportunity, Chuck, to help promote that we have the opportunity for community spotlight performances. And a press release just went out for those um, calls for artists to participate in Arts in the Park. Uh, folks can find that on the city's website uh, for Arts in the Park. Um, but basically this is a way for the city to provide a venue for local artists and art professionals and performers from any background um, and uh, provide a space that they can participate and perform to the community. So there's an application online and folks can, can join on there. And I'll just add to that that this, it, just to be clear, it's free, and there's also a stipend available. So the intention, intention is that it is becoming accessible to artists that may not otherwise have access to a venue or to this site. And I know we're working with the Office of Arts to get it out to some of those arts groups. That's great. So it's like we asked you to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> well, wasn't that what that text was about? <laughs> <laughs> He's kidding. And, yeah, I am kidding. Okay. And, uh, for the record. And uh, Bands on the Bricks, I know that's run by the Downtown Boulder Partnership, right? Do you have any control over that programming? Um, I do not have control over that programming. They certainly are open to our feedback. However, I know that they share your interest and they've been achieving working towards that in two ways. One is they do have a community board where they take input from the community and, and equity is a shared goal for the Downtown Boulder Partnership. And as of last summer, I know that several of their performances were not um, native English speakers. I know that they were performances in other languages, so they are growing that repertoire. It's still predominantly groups that you and I both appreciate and throw back band, the 80s bands is my favorite, but they, I know that they are working towards um, creating that mix. Great. So I think I can just toss them a, hey, our board last night and talking about the programming support of the work that you're doing. Great. And my other comment was, uh, I'm really excited about the Community Forest Corp for the summer, um, getting kids involved in tree care and tree planning. And uh, I think that's a great program. And I'm proud to help support it through Play Boulder Foundation. Oh, go ahead. Um, 
Yeah, I also have a music study to read about the forest court as well. Yeah, sorry, I was excited to read about the community forest court as well. Um, I did have a question. I saw the Pearl Street Fountains on the list of projects. Um, and I know, is that it's the first time I feel like we talked about that or heard of that and why, why now? Is it just to get them to work better? Or I just have a question about that. This list is, um, it's funny because when I saw this, I almost just cut the minor projects because it's such a level of detail you don't normally see. This is all just asset management taking care of things that are broken. So there are existing water fountains on the Pearl Street Mall that are going to be replaced. Okay. It is, projects, it, but it, it is exciting, but this is very minor, minor okay. All right. All right. Which fountain are we talking about? The water there's fountains. Fountains. In front of the civic, in front of the courthouse? You're thinking of the pop jet fountain. I am talking about water fountain. Oh, oh it's drinking fountain. No, fountain. Not, not the pop jet fountain. Okay. Very minor. Yeah. Um, we may, you may tell me that this is not the best time of meeting, but I, so we have this list of major projects. Some of the items on there, maybe, we've been talking, we've talked about all of this for some time, of course. There are definitely some projects on here that seem to be at odds with the financial reporting that we were given and are going to talk about tonight. So, and I'm, you know, there are comments specifically about how we need to be husbanding our existing resources and facilities instead of thinking about new. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that we can have a conversation about like, what does that mean for these things that are maybe in the planning committees? Yeah, so I'm gonna go just back to the future boiler report items on uh, page two. So in your April touch on the budget, you will see a CIP overview that talks about current projects, planned spending. And I know I'm in a team here. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. But um, the other thing I'll call out on this summary of projects, which I, I appreciate the way the team has kept this running list, is um, not all projects in the planning phase will result in construction. And so, for example, let me get back to that page. Um, the Child Friendly Cities Initiative, that will not result in additional construction or um, spending. And the intention is that the end that youth action plan informs the spending of the Broncos money. Mm -hmm. And then the um, similarly with the historic district, um, the court system plan will inform asset management. But anyway, that was a long answer to say, yes, we'll be talking about it in depth April, May, and June. Okay. Is there anything you would add to that question? Would you like to have more on this? Yeah. Okay. Anything from Sunny Online? Nope. Just listening. Okay. So no. Okay. Um, great. Then uh, we will move on to action items. None. Matters for discussion information. None. Matters from the department, the court system plan, and then the budget strategy. Level. Thank you so much. So to talk about the court system plan, we have uh, Tina Briggs and Charlotte O'Donnell from our planning team to share some um, exciting and unfunded plans. <laughs> we also have our consultant, Michael Spitz, from Pro's Consulting on Online. So we'll be doing the majority of the presentation, but he'll be here to ask, absolutely answer any questions um, or any details. All right, with that, we'll dive in. So um, this presentation mirrors a lot of what the community was shown on March 4th at our public meeting. So this is kind of our final stop um, with you all as in terms of this second engagement window for this project. And so we're gonna start with a little bit of background, um, recapping some of what you guys heard in January. Then we'll move on to the concept diagrams for the five sites that we talked with you about in January, where we believe there's potential um, more courts could be accommodated at those sites. Um, and then next steps for the project. So, do you want um, questions as we go along or at the end? Good question. Um, <laughs> do, do you prefer questions? We're going to go with property by property. So, so if you want to do your part, we'll yeah. stop and ask for questions, and then I'll probably, you know, I'll have a couple of spots that I can offer. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll, we'll take a property by property. This overall graphic is showing all the pieces in the schedule that take us to a final plan across the top. You can see we're really ending this concept phase, and we're working toward funding and programming and operations that you'll see later on this plan. But Again, tonight we're here to talk about the 
the concept diagrams. In January, we shared that based on the research and guidance our consultant has completed, we're looking to add 22 dedicated pickleball courts and 22 dedicated tennis courts um, through 2036. And right now, there's another way of looking at where this conceptual diagrams fit, not just in the project, the one project plan, but for each for each property, they would go through this process, this five phase process. And there's multiple steps within each phase of this process. So we're really at more at the beginning of this um, or planning to ribbon cutting, as you say, or getting towards the construction phase. And the concept diagrams that you're going to see tonight are in, intended to be high level ideas and test fits. So that means they're highly flexible. So it's what could happen, not what will happen. And they're providing an opportunity for the community, including you all, to provide input on these projects before they advance into that more technical schematic design phase. And ultimately, as you saw in the last slide, for its construction. So the five concept plans that you'll concept diagram that you'll see tonight are for the properties where this map has those extra big circles, meaning they're um, either the gold circles that have potential future additional tennis and pickleball courts and are part of the capital improvement plan for 2025 to 2030. So that's Belmont City Park, East Florida, or Tom Watson. And then if we're unable to achieve the goal of 44 additional courts at those three sites by 2030. We did look at Gerald Stasio Fields and Foothills Community Park as two alternative sites um, where additional courts could be added to reach those recommended goals if needed. So um, you'll also notice that part of the reason we showed this map is to show how these are geographically, geographically distributed. So we talked a lot about why we selected these sites out of our whole park repertoire, so you may remember in January, I'm happy to rehash any of that or answer more questions on that. Um, but part of what we're looking at is how they're distributed within the city. I can see them. So, but I'm going to hand it over to Tina, and she's going to dive into the actual properties. Yeah, so I'll give a pause to you and maybe just checking with Michael to see if there's anything you'd like to add to that, and then we'll give that pause for process questions right now. No, I'm good. You did great. Thank you. Okay. Let's have them any process questions before we dive into the properties. Okay. Okay, sorry. I, I don't have a question, but I do want to make a statement before we yeah. work again. Um, I, as I've mentioned a couple of times, I've been spending more time with rec centers. I have the opportunity to overhear lots of other people's conversations. Um, yesterday, I was eavesdropping on a person who was having a conversation about this plan. There seems to be a misconception. I don't think it's anything that you all have done wrong, but there definitely seems to be a misconception that we are. Uh, like going to build an indoor facility. And that is, as we all know, like very much a potentiality and very much in the future. And I I do worry that um, members of the tennis football community have like heard a nugget of that and glommed onto it and assumed that it's happening. So I just state that so that you're aware and uh, can you know, manage your communications appropriately. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we'll kind of running through um, as we go through this um, process and properties. Um, what we're looking at for where that could futuristically happen and, and what that looks like. So thank right. you. I'll try to cover that too. Um, I think one thing to add too is we also know um, what we did in some evaluation is we know the city of Boulder is never going to be able to provide all of the tennis courts in the community. Um, so there is a part of responsibility that Parks and Recreation has, but there is private industry partnerships and other things that normally sort of um, create the, the whole um, system of, of courts as well. So just, you know, just to address that, and we know that with every sport that we look at, um, you know, we're not providing, you know, every uh, part of that sport. Just keeping to our master plan um, and focusing on where our course services should be. Um, so thinking about 22 additional courts and 22 pickleball courts, you can imagine that's a Quite a bit of land. So let's talk about um, how we can get there. Can I move this to the next slide, please? Yeah. So this is really just looking at the long plan. You've seen this graphic before. What this really is showing is as we talk about the um, capital improvement plan that it, you know is annually approved um, in conjunction with the capital improvements uh, investment strategy, which is that six-year outlook. We know that 25 
There is funding for Miss Boulder Community Park. There's funding for Belmont uh, for 2028 and Tom Watson for 2030. So how we're getting there is looking at funding that is existing for some of those park re um, renovations already um, and utilizing it um, for the dynamic type of renovation where we can include these. We also know as we follow through, you'll see Foothills and Stasio. What we wanted to do is ensure we looked at all our parks and we were able to um, locate the places that are the right spot for tennis and pickleball. As you can imagine with um, lights and potentially pickleball noise, um, we did evaluate those sites. And we can talk about that criteria again, but we did talk about it in January, so I'm not going to touch on it today with the questions. However, Stasio and um, Foothills aren't on that, that, um, that financial plan yet, um, but they are the places that we would look. Our goal originally this plan was to hit that 22 ports by 2036 or 2038 when we did that, the 2038 um, uh, population growth, but then we kind of dialed it back to 2036 because it matches our capital in terms of strategy. Um, so then we look at that um, third one, you'll see it south, and there were just so many limitations to that um, particular park um, that we, we didn't actually go through it. So um, we're going to focus basically tonight mostly focus on the first three, and I'll probably put a little bit more energy in the east because it's our first fastest opportunity to actually make any impact. Uh, so the overall context for this property is um, for East Boulder Community Park, um, you'll see 63rd, um, sorry, no, it's not 63rd, that's 55th, <laughs> at the top of the map to the north. Um, you can see the East Boulder Recreation Center kind of on the top right, um, and then the pond, the tennis courts are that the blue green there. So just to kind of give you um, uh, overall, like these are existing conditions. And again, these are our greatest near-term possibilities. Um, so we can go to the next slide. I want to look at this one too, and I want to highlight the up to. <laughs> so, um, and then this one does say, up to 16 and up to eight, but this is total on the site. That really is only uh, a potential um, for three or four and move, most likely three for tennis, but then 16 is, um, would be the potential up to uh, four and move for the golf course. And what you'll notice, there are some caveats in here, and I'll read them because I think they're kind of important just to touch base too, right? Is this is meant to show potential configuration. You know, we know that sort of north south configuration. Um, is best. We also know that we haven't um, really like finalized the design evaluation. So we have more um, as we go into design de development, we have more things to look at. We also know that to do something like this, we are just placing some other activities that we would have to um, replace um, in another position um, and hopefully be able to kind of work that into the whole um, plan overall. When do I ask questions again? Um, I'll go through East, and then if you want to ask, I'll kind of pause after that, if that's okay. Um, so the other option um, that we're looking at is that Holden Hancock property that you, are, um, you kind of see in the paint down the side. That's the property that the city purchased a few years ago um, with the intention of having it for utilities and park um, usage. We haven't really done the evaluation um, like first and foremost on what utilities um, needs to have to go in that property. And then we would look at, um, you know, so for example, flood impacts are that. So the first step is really just looking at those impacts. And then the second would be just starting to look at um, annexing into the city. As you can see, it's outside the city limits. Um, and that then will basically allow us to um, add that to the city water utility electricity. Um, that could be potentially 9 to 24 months. We are looking at that while we're in the Plains East, um, so they're going to make things better. And that would just really be the added for the future opportunities. We're not really looking at that um, right now because we don't have the, you know, the um, full okay to, to make that plan. Um, this, so the next slide is just a little bit different. Um, so it's just, it does say up to 16 and up to 8 as a total. Um, the configuration of which are pickleball, which are tennis, what amenities would go with it, um, what that looks like, that'll be the next step of schematic design. So that was the part, um, the process diagram that Charlotte had showed 
where we kind of do some pre planning, we do this conceptual diagram, and then we start getting into the details. This is really just evaluating, like maximizing the property and making sure it's the right place for this type of activity. And okay, well, let's go one more. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you'll see this build through the presentation. So I'll stop there. We might need to go back to the map if you have questions on that. But I'll pause for two things. Mike, if you have anything to add, and then we'll go for questions. I'm good. Thank you. Good job. Can I just throw one thing up? Um, when Charlotte and Tina presented this to the football tennis community, um, the tennis folk were very concerned that we would have these three tennis courts and stop it. And I don't think that's actually likely to happen, but um, they were very worried that like that would be their their concession that they got three new courts, just three new courts. That was their perspective. And I share that with the members of the Raptors here, here and all those add Is that a fair assessment of what they said? I mean, yeah, no, that that is true. And and you know, we talked about too just the continuing ad, you know, advocacy for it um, and how they could potentially best do that, right? To keep it on the top of our radar um, and keep it a positive relationship. Yep. Any other questions? So I think this slide answers my question, but um, there are no dedicated pickleball ball courts there now. So that would be 16 new, right? And then we've got five there now. So there will be three new, so up to eight in total. Okay. Um, and my other question was related to kind of the general planning, and that is whether d does the total number of new courts we're planning to build? include just what we're um, thinking we have the, the capital to build over the next five to 10 years? Um, or does it include uh, the possibility that we might build somewhere else in the future that we don't currently have funding for? So if you look at how that plan works out, so when we looked at the, the first three properties, what we'd like to do is to get as close as to the 22 each um, within that first six years and those first six months. Okay. Now, because we have to do more investigation, there might be land limitations we're unaware of, or if we're not able to um, move an activity into a different area and still support our community like we should, the variation of the number that can go into East will then affect how many we want to put at Belmont, which will then affect how many we put at Tom Watson. And then you'll see the last two, if we're not at that number, we're looking at that next two places to fill that gap. Did that answer yeah, 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 yeah. So like three, we know we're going in. Sixteen pickleball, three courts, tennis courts at East, and then we've got these other sites can will fill in the gap to the projected goal of the total new number of the courts we intend to fill. Correct. Okay. And I will just keep saying up to this to make sure. Right. right. Sometimes when we see that eight, we're like, yay, and it's like, you know, there's still some evaluation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> up to. Oh, yes. One slide to that large bit of um, So the handball courts, those are to the left still, mm -hmm. right? And then the playground is still to the right of the middle one. Correct. So there's, what is, there's nothing currently that says volleyball. Sand volleyball, and there is a practice area. Practice room. And then if you, I don't know, I think it's 500 feet that has to be from the residential area for pickleball. Correct, and we'll be measure this. Is that like, is there kind of a radius? Like, if you if there is an opportunity to expand even beyond this, or this is this is the maximum capacity right here? This is looking at the maximum capacity right here. Uh, but can you go back? I don't want to confuse that one. So, that is the existing capacity of the city park, the community park that is there. Um, when the city purchased Hogan Pan Cost in 2019, it was clear that it could be used for recreational purposes after significant utilities work and annexation and whatever. And so it could be that there is a, um, that additional potential at this site. We've just got some work to do first. Pickleball would be a challenge, though, because the Pickleball could not go there. It's yeah. within the 500 feet of the homes to the south. Yeah. So what's to the west of the westernmost uh, sports field? It's Elian Park. It's, it's like park. a playground. There's like a playground that has courts. Are you talking about this piece of land? Yeah, right there. There. I know there's a park yeah. to the west of that, but it's yeah. right there. Yeah. So that's also used as a practice area. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that has some um, other utilities. Yeah. 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 
Okay, thank you. Hi, flying. <laughs> it's yes, moving to the It's a great spot. Right. Okay. Any other questions on the east? Okay. Um, our next opportunity then we're just going to talk about is Belmont City Park. Um, so just in the overall context, these are the existing conditions um, right now. So what you'll see is at the bottom of the screen um, is East Creek path. So at the, the very corner there is East Pearl. At the very top is Belmont Road. Um, so this is Belmont South. So just north of this or just you know past the top of the screen would be where the dog park and the bike park are currently. Um, so this does have some facilities. You'll see the multi use field. It does have a disc golf, um, some parking, um, at least on the northwest corner. Um, what you think we can go to the next one. And this is the, the same piece of property, but it's shown with our 2015 master plan kind of mask underneath it. Um, so not only looking at the properties, you know, we looked at um, what had been planned out then, following that master plan, looking into that. And really thinking about in that 2015, there was an aquatics facility in there. And so what would, could we do to sort of condense some of the very high active uh, recreation pieces? But again, this is a potential configuration. We know if we did further evaluation, um, looking at that evaluation, right now that road that kind of shows through there doesn't um, go all the way through the Belmont. But we also started thinking a little bit about it. And we're not really going to want our community to have to cross the road to get to there. And then we can go for it. This is looking at the space available and how many courts could fit in the configuration of that north south. So it's the most convenient for play. Um, and adding some parking. And then this is the where the potential um, indoor facility could go. And when I say indoor facility, that could mean a lot of things. We're still doing the evaluation of that. Um, it could be just outdoor, it could be indoor meaning a bubble, it could be indoor meaning um, an actual building. So that one of our next steps is the evaluation of what that looks like. We're not going to end up with all of the answers in this plan because it is further out. I think we need to do some more um, engagement. However, it will give us um, basically a, a decision-making framework to look at. So what are we looking at, um, cost, risk, all of those things. It'll give us um, a really plan on how to get there when we're, when we're ready. It's just the same north south configuration we just saw. Yes. Okay. This summer slide? Okay, yes, we can go one more. Just a little bit closer up and you can do it with me. And then the other one is going to be fun. Um, yeah, we can do well. Let's do this one first. Is this one is really dependent on other um, city projects and some more evaluation. So um, there are some things that currently live in that we have to also be shifting to make this a reality. But again, because we're looking at 2030, I you know we're gonna have to start that pre planning years in advance of that. So we're ready for that um, when we get to it. So if we go to the next slide. It's just building on what that is and what we keep saying up to because there aren't an existing here, it, it is showing um, up to 12 tennis and up to 12 pickleball. Uh, that could be a variation of what that looks like. If we get a whole full 16 pickleball courts um, at East, do we then start to think about if we want to put 12 additionally immediately, right? So we'll at least have some evaluation because that conversation will change if we're only able to put eight pickleball courts in. And then we would want to maximize that. Um, so each one will build and the decisions are really for each other. So this would be the time for questions on that one. Or Michael, if you have anything to add. Uh, I do not. I think the only thing I wanted to make sure of, and when we start to compare the um the dedicated tennis court um new number against the dedicated um pickleball court new number is that. We currently have zero dedicated pickleball courts in, in the court system in Boulder, uh, whereas we do have 20 um, dedicated pickleball courts. Um, I'm sorry, we do have 20 dedicated tennis courts. And so I think um, part of the approach in, in, associated with East um, and then Valmont is to play a little bit of catch up um, with regards to pickleball. Uh, especially in light of some of the new, uh, even latest information in terms of participation numbers. So I think it's just important to keep that in mind that 
um, as you think about these up to numbers and how it impacts that court goal, uh, I think there's some intention uh, behind uh, really trying to play a little bit of catch up with pickleball uh, while also recognizing that that we need to make progress on the tennis court goal number as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of if like road changes are part of the scope of something there, because that stretch of pearl is totally gnarly to be on the bike. There's no shoulder, there's no, it's like you're on the highway and you end up there. It's happened to me like three times, even though like I should remember the front of the bike, but like you can't go down the road because the trucks are really on the bike. Sure. And this is also tying in with what there is, is it an easeful or subcommittee plan. Um, so um, when we look at the development of this, looking at the, the easeful or subcommittee plan and making sure that we do things together and work well together um, is going to be really important for us, especially this site. Okay. So the currently the parks and recreation maintenance charges in the space? Correct. So where would that go? Well, right now they're all we are also, you know, talking about you know, uh, East uh, Campus and the West Campus for staff. And so some of that, when I talked about what would happen is, you know, like some of that has to find a new home or might be uh, developed in a different way. Right. I don't know how it's going to Yeah, but I'm actually have a two hour meeting tomorrow on this long term to kind of to Grace's point earlier, like financial strategy. I want to meet if there is an intention to have an Eastern City campus. So if this is the Western City campus and hub for services and people and services, there is a need for modern infrastructure for maintenance. None of our maintenance um, storage is covered. So we have, we have um, an extent there. This is a whole other topic, but um, no matter what park operations need to be improved and modernized, the intention is for that to live with the Eastern City campus. Thanks. Um, could you develop these courts without doing the pool? Park, uh, park belong, maybe separate or are they integral? That's a good question. Um, it's going to make more sense to develop. Um, so, this is really going to inform the long term benefit of this area. And I would add yes. that developing the whole park is tens of millions of dollars. And so, what would make sense is to update the concept plan so that you're not doing something that precludes future aspirations at the site, but then do it in phases. Right. And so, it, again, just to be clear, you should plan the whole park and then you can develop in phases. Gotcha. Thanks for that question. Yeah. So, like, you know, much like the bike park and the dog park, have them developed in phases. And it struck me that the location for the court and aquatic center, which may or may not ever happen, um, are as far away as possible from housing. And I wonder if it might make more sense to place that closer to the uh, to Valmont. I know you want to keep the pickleball folks away from the home, <laughs> but you also want the access to be reasonable instead of a mile away. 500 feet. I don't think you can make it to go to the northeast corner of the building. But isn't there, there's a large manufactured housing in Correct. Just some right there. Well, uh, the on the Vista Village. There's right lots of there. Lassero here yeah. and Vista Village here. Yeah. So both corners. I think it's more than 500 feet if you want to the where the cursor for Rose's cursor is. We're not building anytime soon. We can look back on them. Yeah. yeah. That, and, that's, and that's exactly why we plan the whole park before we dig. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and just to be clear in this slide, that up to 12 tennis at Valmont City Park would all be built, right? Yes. Correct. So it was our third CIP project. Um, without even a little bit further, is Tom Watson. Um, so for those of you just unfamiliar with it, um, what you see in the upper corner is actually Creek Lake, right? So that is 63rd that runs up um, the left side of that. There are currently tennis courts out there. Um, so this is probably one of our best opportunities to really energize this space. And so when we look at, sorry, you can go to the next one. When we um, look at what this could potentially be is adding pickleball, adding tennis, reconfiguring uh, the playground. There is a the restaurant there is not currently functioning and a little bit of kind of shade shelter outside of that. Um, and as our city grows and we're trying to maximize the use of our spaces, this this has that, um, that place that could be really activated in this space. So 
Um, again, it, it's further out there, um, but with a large parking, a large uh, loss to access, and um, kind of fits the bill for location needs and property. So, if we want to go, this again is up to four additional tennis courts in addition to the four that are just in the So, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then the second wall. So, just kind of to define which. When we say up to the reason I'm kind of leaving that in there is when we did the public meeting, we had up to eight and then kind of tried to define that you know, that not going three in, but I just want to make sure it's clear and it didn't feel like an issue as well. Yeah. Um, so looking at this is basically what we're looking at is trying to get to that 22 dedicated tennis and 22 dedicated pickleball in a combination um, of one of these in these parks. And again, moving into that um, schematic design east, uh, we'll kind of you know, just tailor down into what we're, what is at each park in particular. Um, and then what we know is if we can't reach that goal uh, is by, and this is again by 2030, and our plan is intended to be through that 2036, we have the two following parks uh, that can help fill those gaps. Made for 20. Yeah. Yeah. So it says up to 22 new tennis and 22 new pickleball, and I know this is the max capacity of each. Yes. So is the 22 like the lower end of that, or you might have said that I just missed it. So our goal is 22 courts of each by 2036, and you'll see this only goes through 2030. Okay. So what we're trying to do is get there as quickly as we can because we know there's an impact. So this is our plan till 2030. It's not going to get us quite to the 22. We're going to be really close if we can maximize them. And then we have the other places. And you said, like, you know, just looking at tennis, this is what, 28 in each course. But I think you said, at least, like, you're able to put 16 pickleball courts in each year. Obviously, it would not need to go further. Yeah. But this would still. It could still cascade, right? Like, the, the also the capacity of, like, pickleball is growing so fast, right? And keep an eye on that. We know our goal is 22. That's going to be kind of our, our, our guiding light in the short term. Um, but then this also is that consideration of what happens in the building. Sure. So, you know, if that property were able to be developed and we plan to make, you know, as a kind of park turn and be older, the tennis courts that we put would be able to put there would you know, set some of what this looks like. Have we done an analysis of like how often Tom Watson's current courts are used? Like, is that a heavily used court system? So we actually just resurfaced them. So the use had declined, um, and with the new resurface, it was one of the only places that we played in our system because it's the only place where we have uh, key availability of those four tennis courts together. No, I'm just trying to like. Okay. <laughs> so here's a question. We all know we've heard a lot about how quickly this law is growing. Is another four years going to give us a meaningful look into whether that growth will be sustained or is it a plateau at some point or will we not have four years? Yeah, yeah. Mike, are you on? Would you be able to answer that? I'm, I'm sorry. Was that a, a question? I You guys are yeah. fading in and out a little bit. Sorry. Can you ask that again? Yeah, so my question was, um, we've heard a lot about how rapidly pickleball is growing in participation. And I, I asked, in the next four years, before we get to some of the latter phases of this plan, will we have a sense of whether that growth will be sustained, or will that not be enough time for us to know? That is an absolutely great question, and I'll, put, I'll give you some context to this. So at the time that we did this level of service study, we were based on um, full 2022 participation national and then, of course, drilled that down to, to local participation. Uh, I'll put this in perspective for you. Um, national, uh, as of the end of 2022, uh, pickleball participation was 8.9 million people. It has grown by another 5 million people participating in pickleball just in the last year. Um and it is now the sixth most participated sport in the country, uh, right behind soccer. Uh, so I, I think the only way that pickleball slows down is if um, there are no courts 
uh, in the system or in people's systems in order for it to to continue to grow. Um, it is a sport that is increasingly getting younger uh, and is appealing to, um, quite honestly, uh, almost all age segments. Uh, so uh, I think the point, um, and, and Tina, if you wanted to scoot forward one to the this impact here, um, when we said that our pickleball goal was 22, and we're showing here a pickleball goal of potentially up to 36, um, if I'm doing my math correctly, uh, that's maybe not necessarily out of the realm of demand um, or the kind of level of service. So um, it's hard to predict. Uh, I don't know that anybody um, in the parks and recreation world uh, over the last two or three decades has experienced a singular sport or singular activity um, that has grown so substantially and so quickly um, that it to the point where it is no longer can be considered to be a fad to the point that it's becoming professionalized. Um, and I think we all know what happens when things in the United States become professionalized and monetized. Um, it becomes capitalized on and you can start to see that potential uh, start to trickle down to, um, you know, even potentially it becoming quote unquote, a high school sport, no differently than tennis is. So, uh, I think the growth here um, is substantial. Uh, maybe the another way to say it is, could you imagine the almost the exact number of people participating in soccer in the country um, as we currently have in pickleball? Uh, they're right neck and neck and having no soccer fields. Um, that is basically what uh, Boulder is up against right now with having no dedicated pickleball courts. Thanks, Lee. Yeah, I, I would add to that, though, that, again, with pickleball, we won't be the 100% supplier. Um, especially with pickleball, we have seen it be monetized, and we have seen private development. You guys maybe have noticed already um, some private developments coming in, um, especially in the indoor space, but also in having outdoor space next to restaurants and bars. So um, we still believe 22 is the right goal for now, but, um, yeah, we should get that context. Yeah, the other context to that too is like as we evaluate this through the years, there's budget implications, and you know what we're what we're prioritizing is funding a funding one to um, that's part of that evaluation. So, it's probably it's, it's bound to probably answer my question, but I was going to ask you about the current hybrid course mm -hmm. uh, that nobody seems really happy with, but seems like you're trying to sort of pick the ball player on that's sensitive uh i'm not a point of or anything but um what would if you know just going back to the east if, if 16 pickleball courts are built in by 2025 would that have any implications for those hybrid courts did you guys have answers for no we okay. didn't um I, not this no, round uh, yeah. <laughs> um but what we will do is what we're going to do is current we're going to maintain those multi-use courts until we actually have some dedicated courts and for pickleball and some additional tennis sports. And we're also renovating several tennis sports to make them more playable and fit at a higher value level. Then I think it's time to then evaluate that. What we don't know is, uh, is pickleball going to grow enough that all of those courts, the multi-sport and the dedicated are going to be full? Or are they all going to migrate to really watch that renovation usage? And if that drops dramatically, right, then we and having some indication on what we need to do with those sports in the future. So, mm -hmm. other questions on Tom Wilson before we go to the next two? Okay. Um, this is Stasio Park. So, it is um, it's mostly known as, as a ball field right now. And so, what you're seeing on the screen right here, Baumont is across the top. And these are actually the northernmost set of ball fields. These are the next um, next slide. This shows a, a, a view kind of the bigger property with the, the, the full ball fields and full clover of ball fields at the bottom and then three at the top. And it shows a potential location for additional. Um, and this should say tennis or pickleball courts. It does just say tennis, but it could be either based on uh, need at the time. This one just really has some. Um, wetlands to consider and then also 
um, to finish that or that closure of that ball game to um, might be a priority for this space and we need to basically reconsider parking. Um, so there's lots of considerations as we move, move into some customary design, um, but they physically would fit their in our farm up away from the house with four other parts as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's just um, again, it's up to six tennis. There is some topography there that the design can only again just let us talk a bit about how we get around those. And for example, the bathrooms are quite a ways away. Um, so not as ideal, but we're moving into that sort of back of time to get where we need to go. And we can go to the next one. It's just looking at foot bounds. So this is another one of our community parks. Um, you'll see a lot of these are in our bigger parks, community parks, and city parks, um, because they do already have some of the uh, infrastructure that's needed. So the original, oh, I should go with that. Um, this basically is located, um, what you see is Broadway is just off to um, the right side of that picture, and you would take Cherry Avenue in on the bottom, and this is where you, you probably sit still up on the top of the dog park. You see the bathrooms and shelters. Um, so this original master plan did have tennis courts included in it. But on the next slide, we know that we cannot put purple ball courts here because they are too close um, to that urban um, development. Um, what this would do is potentially um, you know, maybe place the dog park in a, in a different location and reconfigure. These could be tennis courts and they have room for expansion um, of the property as well. And I will pause there if there are any questions on any of those jobs. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure you're just playing with me here by showing an expanded parking lot with 115 spaces for eight tennis courts that can hold four people each court. We <laughs> presume we don't all drive separately there anyway. That is true. So we looked at a multiple configurations when we originated the expanded parking lot. So we wouldn't have to expand that far. That would be the maximum. If we were to, you know, displace the dog park further, there actually could potentially be a second set of courts there. But what we were looking at is sort of just the property of what made the most sense. Um, this is where it would it landed and we could reduce that back to the address. That's a good question. I want to make another note though. So this is this park is one that and I had to go into the deep dives of park history, but the concept plan for this community park, similar to what we just looked at these where every inch is developed, that is what will happen at this park over time. And so similar to Belmont, what would make the most sense is that you do update that concept plan. The last one is from 2002, but there's ball fields and tennis courts and we have increasing need for active recreation sites. So that's part of the long-term planning you're gonna start hearing us talk about around what amenities do we need and how many and where. Um, and so part of it would be, what is the level of parking when the whole park is developed? Because there's a significant amount of acreage that isn't developed. So I would expect at that time that the parking is not just about tennis, it's other amenities to come. Yeah. And not just to annoy Chuck Rock. <laughs> <laughs> we, we also see the youth fields that are down here at the south, at the at the south edge of this park when those are full of flag football or soccer we do see that parking um, reach capacity at least at this place. so yeah it goes into the over it exceeds about, capacity right. that's one of the number one complaints from the neighbors so yeah even with the park not being developed and i will hand it over to <laughs> other concept questions in this on property so to bring us back to the present moment, um, in 2024, we are moving forward with the asset management, the asset maintenance on Arapahoe Ridge and Columbine. These are two of our worst performing tennis courts in the city right now. So replacing those with post-tension concrete that will improve the playability and safety and um, make them playable for longer at a lower cost to us. As well as this year, beginning that technical design work, the schematic design um, for East Boulder Community Park. So taking that loose concept diagram you saw tonight and turning it into something that can be acted upon on the site. For this plan, um, for the court system plan, our next steps are to refine the concept diagrams based on any comments that you all have tonight, as well as any 
comments we receive from the public, either online or at that public meeting. Um, then, we'll, as I mentioned at the beginning, we'll be using looking at programming, operations, and financial piece to this plan before we come back to you later in just a couple months with, with a final plan. The final draft <laughs> of the plan. Well, that's, that's all from us tonight. Other questions overall or on the concepts? This is great. Um, I'm impressed with how quickly this is all, this whole process is moving, I'm sure. Yeah. It's inducing some vertigo on your part. But, uh, <laughs> thanks for taking community input seriously and moving forward so rapidly. You should clarify, Anvil can be a separate process too. Like that. Yeah, so we looked at other, um, there were some other facilities that we looked at. So there was evaluation of like a handball platform tennis, basketball courts, and that sort of thing. Um, and we looked at users and growth. There were a couple things we looked at. So just to simplify it, uh, and we were focusing on tennis and pickleball because of the things that were happening in the community with tennis and not having any pickleball courts. Um, so we're certainly not forgetting about those. So what we do know is the two that you see, Ms. Gilder and um, Tom Watson, are both on our CIP plan. They both have handball courts, and those are definitely a deeper dive than what that looks like. Um, you know, whether that means you know, renovation or um, that would be something we would talk to the community about as we move into those questions. So I'm sorry for Chuck and Jason, but I just have to add that in the next two years, you're going to hear a lot about a long-term strategy around recreation use, the facilities. And by recreation, I don't mean parks and recreation. I mean the activity that happens on parkland and in our facilities. And really looking at a, at a long-term 50-year plan for what it looks like. It's more, our last really robust recreation needs assessment is from 2002, so we'll be updating that. Um, and we've just finally signed a contract. It's called Placer AI. It gives incredible. So right now, park use data is observational, and there's 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 research based methodology. But this data that we're going to have through Placer AI about what is used and where people come from and where they're going is going to be one of the most incredible advancements in. 15 minute neighborhoods and some of the conversation last week around soccer and where people coming from or where they're going like. You're all going to be drooling over this data. It's very exciting. I, I, I do love to do it. You might, yeah, you might not be as excited as I am, but it's <laughs> you're hearing a lot in the next few years. You, you can watch, and I mean, you know how to text me. <laughs> so before I move on, I'd like to check in with Sunny to make sure she doesn't have any questions or comments. Not at this time. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks. I'm kind of out of sight, out of mind. So <laughs> speak up if you have anything to say, please. Thanks. Will do. Great. Okay. Thank you. That's Thank everything. You. Great. Uh, next up is the budget strategy roadmap. We have our senior business services manager, Jackson Pinkman, and CC. Oh, he's leading. He's leading. We're going to have to go to the next one. Awesome. So I'll be right back. Well, we're going to have to pull out that we'll call out there's very bright colored boards in front of you. This is from the consent item that talks about our summer squad updates. Uh, and so you do have flyers in there, minimum majors for positions, uh, English and Spanish flyers. QR codes. Um, we're doing little names for all the front desk staff that says how long they've worked with the department. Um, I think this year is fourth year to play here, go here. Um, so we're very excited about that, but I just wanted to say that's out there. And then we have ordered five for all of our summer employees. You can really see them in these beautiful bucket hats and mini packs, um, which I'm staying in the so that, uh, I wanted to take a moment. If you see someone with any of the song this summer, please help them I help them thank you. There are seasonal employees on the front lines. I just noticed the flyers around the rec center look great. Um, are you advertising kind of online as well? Yes, we are. Uh, Where are you finding some best? We are online. You have flyers up in uh, both high schools. We've attended job fairs. Um, we're headed up to Eldora for a job fair with Eldora staff, I believe, next week or the week after. Um, so, what we find typically is word of mouth um, referrals are our best bet. We do have a $100 referral bonus this year. So, if you have someone that you refer and you're currently working for us, you'll get $100 paid out in July. 
Um, we really view that as an incentive to bring friends to work with you. Um, we think what is not the advertising is probably the best mechanism to get people to work. Hi, right, well, thanks for what you mean. Uh, Fairview and Boulder High. Um, we have also attended some artists um, for another event. Um, we have staff that are reaching out, our game director comes from the with the YSI program. We have uh, players going up there. So there's also like the Vista overtime and voting personal and child follow up on all of this. Thank you. Just it's not having people who should. Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, reach to the other this one. Thank you. Um, all right, so thank you for letting me do a quick interjection there. Um, we are going to go over the budget development. Um, I do number two of you. This is your last meeting on top, so. Our intention is to keep this very high level. We will have a bigger ask at the um, You all know. You can pause real quick. Yeah. All right. So we will keep this very high level tonight. Um, we do have three more touches in April, May, and June. Um, but this is kind of a better understanding of what our current state is. And the guidance we're giving staff during the entire budget development. So um, I feel like Stacey and I are here with you half the year every year um, in this new folder. Budget is a marathon, not a print. So um, it's scary that we're in mid March talking about 2021 budget development. Um, but we're going to tag in this presentation and please interject if you have questions. Um, and I will turn it over to Stacey. Yeah, so good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for your time, support, and leading another budget development process. I hope you. Look at 2025, as Gatsby just mentioned, it is certainly maybe not a sprint, and we're already about a month into developing 2025. So I'm um, really excited to be here tonight and looking to take this off with the crowd. Um, as you can see up on the slide, our discussion is going to focus first around the department's funding sources. I did um, hand out a fund chart to everyone in the beginning of the meeting, so to keep this handy, we will reference this. Sunny, for you online, the fund chart was actually part of the crab packet as well. So I don't know if you can access that, but it just may be helpful um, to look at that. Um, because our department benefits from a diverse funding streams, um, including dedicated taxes, sales and property tax, user fees, the general fund support, and other fund support, it's just really helpful to understand the various funding sources, not only for the financial review we're going to do tonight, but in future months, but also for the 2025 budget development. Um, so as Jackson mentioned, if you do have questions, please ask them. We do want this to be engaging and interactive. We have scheduled multiple breaks throughout the presentation um, as we go through this. We'll be looking at the 2025 budget strategy and analysis, and we'll also be looking at the policy review. All right, so we're going to start with a timeline. Um, looking at our timeline, the PREP's involvement is outlined on the top part of the slide um, with staff responsibilities kind of earmarked in green on the bottom. So tonight we do start the first touch with that financial review, looking at our strategy, and also reviewing the fee policy and schedule with the PREP. Um, it was a lot of our work that we did in 2024 with you all um, and we do have some updates planned to that for 2025. Looking towards April, we will be um, presenting some updates, recommended updates to the fee policy. In that will also be a first touch for the CIP projects. As we move into May, we will be bringing back to the PREAP a 2025 budget review. You will have your second touch with the CIP for 2025 through 2030. And then at that meeting, we will be asking for PREAP's approval for um, some changes to the fee policy and schedule. In June, we will return um, and just give you a holistic budget review of what is being submitted for 2025. Um, also at this meeting, um, we will hopefully be approving the permanent park and recreation fund CIP. Just as a reminder, PRAD does have formal approval for all capital expenditures from the permanent park and recreation fund. Um, and then on the bottom, um, this outlines what the department will be focusing to make sure that we are moving through the process, doing our analysis, our modeling, um, and then also 
preparing um, for meetings with you all. So next slide. All right, so we are going to go over an overview of the department's five main funds. And um, if you want to refer to your fund chart, uh, we will just be moving left to right on this, uh, no particular order. We we'll start with the general fund, which is our governmental fund. And that really um, helps fund the operations and maintenance and then also administrative support services for the department. Um, the general fund is supported by fees, sales, property, and other taxes. It is a fund that is managed by our finance department here at the city and is allocated citywide. Uh, for our department, we use this to fund forestry, urban parks, our department administration, and our urban rangers program. Uh, for 2024 approved, we do have $6.4 million. Um, and that is in the first column there. And you kind of see how much um, each area does have um, on your pie chart. Um, the next fund to take a look at is our lottery fund, which is a special revenue fund. This is a state conservation trust fund. Money is allocated to the local government. Um, the city of Boulder does receive lottery fund money, and it is distributed out uh, to the city, to our department, also to public works, and to LSMP. Uh, for our department, it's dedicated to parks, recreation, and open space site maintenance and capital improvements. Um, for 2024, we do have 1.5 approved in our budget. And I do want to make mention that historically, for the past several years, the department has had about $428,000 consistently. And so the city for 2024 budget development based on our capital projects that we have did increase our funding for 2024, which we all looked at um, a significant uh, positive and a great win. Um, during that budget development process. Can I ask a question about the lottery fund? Yes. So it says that it's dedicated to parks, rec, and open space, you know, and you read the rest, but who determines that? The city by ordinance or by policy, or do we determine that? Or is it determined by the lottery people? So funding is actually allocated to the city based on lottery funds, and the city of Boulder does receive a certain portion of what the state collects. Um, it's a great question on how much is allocated to our department, um, and it actually has fluctuated. So traditionally, we did receive a certain percentage of funding. We were split between the three departments. Last year, because of our capital projects, we were awarded more funding. So it's not um, really set in stone. Um, we get more funding, but- um, But is the-, is the the manner in which we use it set in stone. Like, it seems like there's a, it is. we can only use it in a certain way. And I'm wondering who determines that? Is, do we determine it as a department or does the city determine it? That's coming from the city. It's a state that yeah. we'll have a lottery fund where allocated it has certain allocations it can be used for. Um, it's park improvement and maintenance of, we do not use it for any of our parking lots, lots salaries. No. Okay. Correct. Okay. And that's from the state. Yes. Okay. We do report back into the state on an annual basis the report of exactly how that funding is used. Okay. So if, the, if, if we wanted to change that rule or something, we'd have to go to the state and do that. Okay. Correct. It's a restricted fund. Okay. Um, up there, when under uses, it says dedicated to parks and recreation, but here I don't see any recreation under the uses. We call land improvements and park development recreation opportunities. So um, examples of how this fund is used, the Scott Carpenter Playground was purchased using lottery funds. Um, so we are building assets that people can participate in. So this fund's offering to be a neighborhood park refresh and can use lottery funds for that. So that's how it goes into recreation. And how does this vary annually? I don't, I'm, I'm familiar with lottery sales. Do they go up and down with the economy? How do they how do they change? How much you fund? Um, what we've seen in over the last four years, the revenue we see has gone up significantly. Um, if you think about it, that's when the lot price of lottery tickets doubled. Um, there have been larger jackpots that it tends to follow that. Um, and then it is divided out um, across the entire state based on population. So um Boulder's population is relatively large that we would get a fair share portion for the population. But it's not highly volatile. 
I think it has grown every year. Every year. Oh, well, since years I've been here. Not so many years ago. Yeah. Well, we can learn at the end of the year or not, which you know, we probably would have. I want to add something to it. And I, Elliot, I know it wasn't your question how it's allocated, but I do, I, I want to celebrate this because prior to last year, it was just evenly split between open space utilities and parks and recreation. And our team said, can we look at that? And it, it, I, I, my interpretation, and it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily based on our capital. It was based on the incredible work our budget team does, and our team across the departments to show our asset management needs and the way we're managing the budget, and that there were unmet needs. And so the entire allocation is going to parks and recreation. That's where you saw the incredible grant over here, because I'm really proud of that work that our team did and the, the decision. Recognizing both utilities has its enterprise funds. Well done. Okay, moving on to our next fund, um, that is going to be the 0.25 cent sales tax fund, which is a uh, special revenue fund. <laughs> okay. Also, can you move your screen sharing window there? Is there anything that's happening? Thank you. <laughs> Um, a special revenue fund, it is uh, funded by voter approved sales tax funds. Um, for our department, we do use this uh, for acquiring, developing, operating, maintaining parks and recreation facilities. So there is a little bit more flexibility with this fund and its uses that we can use it for operations and maintenance and then also capital. Um, and it does help fund daily operations, routine maintenance, and also our capital improvement um, program. So just a little graph, just love to share this for every retail um, sales dollar collected in Boulder. You know, the department does receive a three cents for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is it called the 20, 20, 25 cents sales tax fund? It is 0.25 of a cents on every dollar of sales tax you get. Okay. So for every dollar, so for every dollar we get 0 0.02. No, point zero zero two five. Point zero one would be one percent. We get point zero zero two five. And do the people of Boulder approve that, or is it the... voter approved? Yes. It's voter approved in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they did extend it. Um, it was first approved. In 1995, for a 20 year period, voters did approve it in the set on the 35 and also It's not a county thing, it's a city of Boulder thing. City of Boulder. So, how come the county gets a chunk? So, for every retail sales tax in Boulder that's collected, the city gets 44 cents out of that 44 cents of the sales tax collected by Boulder, the department gets the three cents. Elliot, the right hand slide is showing anywhere in City Boulder that you need to purchase. That's how it gets allocated. But the 12.25 is just a dedicated for parts of migration. I see. Mm -hmm. And you can see that open space gets 10 cents yep. on every dollar of sales tax, which is why we need to be involved in Right. Well, this is a great graphic the city has provided just to show that um, anytime you're purchasing in Boulder, a good majority of it is going to the city, but it is also going to the state, and then it's going to other voter approved initiatives. Yeah. So this is this on the right side just is, is a conglomerate of like the sales tax universe right. in Boulder, right. not necessarily tied directly to this 25 percent. Why couldn't they just like double it? I'm not solve your budget. Double the point two five. That, that would, would be, be a plus to the voters, but I would yeah. more than that. Yeah, I would agree with you. Yeah. Total sales tax is not by the state, though, right? It can't exceed some. You know, Correct. We're close to that. We have some room, and then there's also property. Well, we'll keep going. Yeah. We have to be able but, to exempt ourselves from that. But, right? Sure. <laughs> But one thing I'll note when you talk about funding mix is sales tax is seen as the most regressive, right? It applies equally to everyone and impacts those lower income earners the most. Well, property well, tax is seen as a more equitable way to distribute expenses. And lottery? Very regressive. <laughs> 
but, but, but I have not seen the analysis on the equity impacts of lottery funds and how they're collected and distributed. It would be an interesting thing to read. We're looking at our 2010 before we advance um, for 2024 uh, use sources, which is on the top. Um, we're budgeted 11.48 million, and we do have uh, number 14 on the budgeted um, for expenditures for 2024. All right, the next fund to review is the Recreation Activity Fund, uh, which is a special revenue quasi enterprise fund. Um, during budget development, you will be here is talking and spending a lot of time developing um, the budget for the RAF, or the Recreation Activity Fund, which is really about a third of the department's total budget. Um, we spend a lot of time with the Recreation Activity Fund because it does operate like a business with revenue and expenses needing to be in ratio. Um, we do have this being funded by user fees and participation fees, grants and donations, and then we also do receive um, a general fund subsidy to offset that community benefit programming. Um, the uses for the department, it operates recreation, um, the reservoir, the golf course, all of our services and programs. For 2024, uh, we do have a budget for uh, revenue coming in just under 15 million, and we do have expenses budgeted at 14.7 million for this fund. Any questions? So, as opposed to the, and I'm just, this is like me just speaking aloud to remember what these things mean. The general fund is like us saying to the city, please give us an allocation that we deserve as a city department. Um, for the needs we have, this is based on user fees mostly. Correct. And yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, this is user participation fees, grants, and donations, primarily for funding for this fund. Uh, we do receive about 1.6 million from the general fund as a subsidy to offset community benefit programming uh, within that fund to provide scholarships um, and those community benefit programs. That's a separate. Um, benefit to us from the general fund we get. So they give us cash for the general fund, and then they also give us a such an amount of subsidy. Yes. So okay. we will have the six point four million in the general fund to use. Then we will have a one point six million dollar subsidy transfer into the RAF in twenty twenty four to help offset that community benefit program. So why not just increase the? Why doesn't the city just give us one point six million million more in general funds? Library service, sorry, not library, um, police, fire, like there's just, we do ask for funding. I think they want to specifically give it to the equity programs for recreation activities, mm -hmm. is why it's not included in the general fund. It's transferred. tied directly back to HBase discounts, which we are providing for access to the rec centers, um, our financial aid program, scholarships. Um, anything we start with people with disabilities, manufacturer fund, um, YSI programming, all of that comes out of the general fund subsidy, but tying that directly to the fund where the revenues are received. Um, and those expenses are made, it makes a lot of sense to be able to track it. Um, so we hit about 85% cost recovery excluding um, that uh, subsidy just because of how the funding comes in and it goes out. Okay. I think because we have earned revenue within the RAF, our preference would be to maintain the subsidy into the RAF rather than become part of the general fund. Mm -hmm. Any dollar that we earn then goes back to the general fund and can easily be combined with something else. I see. <clears throat> okay, that makes more sense. This is a quality in the price fund, so it is supposed to be more of a not profit driver, but a break even fund. But every year we are looking for the break even, not fully. While still providing this community benefit programs. And those community benefit programs we provide under the recreation activity fund. Okay. Too. Great. Thanks. Okay. The next slide is a permit park and recreation fund. Uh, it is a capital project fund. It is funded by property and development excise taxes. Um, this is the fund that. The family have approval of the CIP expenditures for 
um, the uses for this is it is dedicated for acquiring land, renovating or improving existing parks mm -hmm. and recreation facilities, and it does not fund the daily operation of four of the two So this is another dedicated fund that the department does have. Um, for 2024, um, the bulk revenue coming in and expenses going out, um, they're kind of budgeted at five million. And once again, this graphic on the right shows the citywide property tax collection of that. We get uh, three, I'm sorry, one cent out of every um, dollar in property tax paid. So permanent park and rec fund is property tax based. The 0.25 cent sales tax, sales tax based. Yep. Okay. Recreational activity fund, mainly uses the recreation yeah, I do need this reminder every year. It's this chart is so helpful. It should be framed in your office. <laughs> yeah, no, at this point. It will be. Uh, at least push down. Turn into a place map and you'll leave it. <laughs> laminated. Yeah, my child's so fifth grader laminated. Yeah. And what I will highlight is these are the five consistent sources of funding we have year over year. There's three other funds that we get for one time projects, CIP related. So these are the five that we're actually going to prepare for you each year. There's another pot of money that is project specific uh, that we'll talk about on the next slide. Yeah, just that again, that's not related to our work here, but it's shocking that it's only 14% of the property tax that go to city services. I feel like that should be a receipt. I think we're, people don't have a sense of that. I think people think, like, oh, look how much we're paying these payments. We're not seeing any results. And then I think most people need to understand that we're only you know, getting you got to be like now, right? Well, I mean, even then, that's a low, like, I don't think we got it. That's a good point. Yeah. Do you have a quick question about your chart? Um, the headline here says the sources are 39 million and the uses, which I presume mean expenses, are 44.7 million. Can I add up your pie charts here? I have a deficit of 2.5 million in the uh, sales tax bond and point four million in the permanent point two million fund. So this says that forty four point seven million does have the other capital that's not recognized in these funds. Um, so we do have some um, capital development and um, coming in for CIP usage. We also have some money that's in the budget from the Boulder Junction Fund, and we also have some general funds for some market funds. That's not in the five funds. So all together with that capital. Um, it does come up to the 44.7 million. That does not include, however, on this chart, if you have seen the um, graphs, there is additional money from the CCRS, the Community Culture Safety and Resilience Tax, with another 4.5 million that we are receiving uh, for 2024. Most of the 24 million is slotted for uh, the joint facilities project for the East Boulder Community Center for those facilities. So we do have it captured in the next slide you'll see okay, because thanks. we do manage all of the funds and all of our We cabinets. have a balanced budget, is that? Yeah, we're balanced. <laughs> Excellent. We're balanced. Yeah. Sure. It's <laughs> it's expand on that. <laughs> <laughs> to expand on that a little bit more, the two funds that you called out with the deficit spending are our capital funds. What we do with our capital funds is we save up for a year and we have a year where we spend a lot more. Um, yeah. So because we've had excess revenue budget and we savings from um, staffing and delayed CIP projects, that's why we're spending more money. We anticipate because of property tax valuations going up that we're going to have, um, you know, a lot more money in this particular pot. That's the the city money does money consult is. with CU for both the property and for the sales tax. As we are doing the budget development, they just did their consultation last year, and um, they're pretty comfortable with the numbers that they gave us. That sales tax is flattening um, for 2024. So we budgeted the 11.3 million for that. And then also they did do the analysis with the uh, property tax revenue um, coming in at least for 2024. So it will be the same process for 2025 budget development. We are in contact with them. And really, the central finance office will give us those projections out, um, not only for the next year, but when we project out into the out years. So they can see sales tax flattening and 
Um, in terms of the sales tax being a regressive tax, I was wondering if there's any analysis about what percentage of sales tax revenues are like from rentals versus uh, tourists. Well, it'd be hard to tell. I'm not aware if it's broken down individually. What we can see is where the firm sale was. So out of state, actually, it was about 23% of revenue to the sales tax. Um, so anytime you're purchasing on Amazon and order from Best Buy or elsewhere, um, all of that comes in. Uh, we can double check with our colleagues in central budgets to see if they have a better idea. And it varies by town because I do know, you know, so the revenue reports that Central Finance publishes every month, we get, we, we do get reports by district. So the downtown district, I would suspect it has a higher proportion of non residents than North Boulder or South Boulder. But across the city, I've not seen analysis of, of the origin of sales tax dollars other than in the tourist areas downtown. But if, yeah, stay tuned. And I'll get back to your question about property tax. I did want to highlight the city is going with a slightly conservative approach just because of funding legislation at the state level um, as far as what that does to sales tax. Um, the projections used was about an 18 to 20 percent growth in sales tax uh, compared to the prior assessment here. Um, I think everyone's property tax varies, but um, 18 to 20 seems probably on the lower end. Um, and that was conservative in nature due to funding legislation and not wanting to come back and form of that in the future. Yeah. Thanks. Any questions? Is that reflected in this number here, like this 4.6? Correct, that's the conservative number. Okay, but that could end up being a little higher. It could be higher next year. Okay. But then we see sales tax maybe flattening. So like it'll be 11.5 next year, the year after, based on a conservative estimate. Okay. Oh, that was a lot of information. What's the most like fungible? Um, what's the source of money that typically um, has the most variance year to year? Like, what's the most stable to the most unstable? It's honestly changed every year. Um, I would say our portion of the general fund has remained relatively constant year over year, as well as the subsidies over half. Um, I think otherwise, there is huge variation based on the economy. Um, 2018, we had a 10% reduction in sales and use tax. Um, that number decreased even more with the pandemic. Property tax, we probably saw an explosion in growth um, just with uh, property prices over the last few years. So most agencies would say that sales and use tax is a little bit more consistent year over year um, because people need to buy other services, the food on the table, et cetera. Um, but it really changes every budget cycle. I'll, I'll go. I think to your point as well, the city does maintain reserves. So almost every fund has a 20% reserve, and that's intended to weather through fluctuations in revenue. Um, if there was a flood, we would tap into that for um, recovery efforts. So there is the reserve on top of this that is meant as that city net for us. I was just going to say that for parks and recreation, the benefit is this diversity of funding sources that we have property tax, that we have sales tax, that we have user fees. Um, and, and in most years, that that gives us some strength. Now, if you think you were like 2020, the raft would be most volatile because it's, you know, 85% sourced by user fees, which really impacted our ability to provide real community benefit programming because there wasn't funding that. Whereas other parks and recreation agencies that have a stronger, larger, more stable tax, property tax, like so for example, parks and recreation districts that were funded by property tax didn't have to reduce services to the level that we did. Um, but to Jackson's point around sales tax, you know, both the general fund and the point to buy or sales tax. So together that that puts that is a risky situation for us because anytime sales tax is down, it impacts a, a large portion of our fund. In Boulder County, property tax is seen as pretty stable. One thing that caught my eye when I was reading through that report, uh, I think that's in our packet, is the general trend downward in use of our program. Uh, have has that been reflected in the in the raft over the last five six years? I think you're referencing about like yes, not since our actually 
Um, the interesting thing about that is the timing as far as you know, the for records and consultants. Um, they looked at 2016 through 2021 actuals, where if you think about it, 2020 and 2021 were pretty bad years for us. They didn't back out that data. They didn't back it out. It was a six year trend line over that entire period. Okay. What we're seeing is we have just now hit 2019 visitation levels across the board. Um, that I want to say we are on the good screen, but we basically was to pre pandemic levels with the number of participants, visitations per hour, ex services. Yeah. So, what about up to 2019? Was that pretty stable? Was it trending up? Was it trending down? It really varies depending on the program area based on what the desired interest is, and it's also hard to do an analyst apples comparison. Um, Golf has seen tremendous growth over the past four years. That golf members are probably 60% more than they were pre pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, field usage is up. Our visitation at the recreation centers are actually down in terms of total volume over the course of the year. But in terms of visitors per hour, we are very stable to 2018. Um, and those numbers have remained relatively consistent. So, is the hours important? Yes. Yeah. Um, summer camps, I think, uh, just seeing the aging population of Boulder. Um, as well as just fierce competition. That's something that we would love to offer more, but there is a baseline that we can really staff based on our um, number of staff, number of locations where we can run licensed to child care. The Virgin Manifest program for New York program has grown substantially, hitting over a million dollars last year in revenue. So, okay. you know, and just to Jackson's point, once we look at months and slide in the moment, uh, you know, the recreation centers, they um, did grow about 22% over 2022 actual. So we did see a substantial growth in 2023, which is great to see that recovery because it would have been something we've been watching so closely. Um, and 2024. Okay. Any other questions? So we're just going to do a really high level of increases um, of our funds. I find you know, that everyone is familiar with those star funds. Um, I will say that with the caveat is that finance is still closing out the year. So, um, you know, there may be 2% to 3% change in these numbers as the year gets closed out. But in looking at this um, on our staff columns, we will have all of our funds. The 2019. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I think you can totally hide that thing if you want to. I sort of mean, oh, sorry. I don't know. So in looking at this, this does show the department's um, use of the funds or our expenditures um, from 2019 through the 2024 approved budget, 2019 through 2022 are actuals. We do have the 2023 um, budget, 2023 actuals as it stands um, as of right now, and then the 2024 approved budget. Um, as we look across the fund, I think it does give a good visual. You'll see where the general fund has been pretty stable from 2019. Um, through basically 2023 spend, um, so the fluctuation there. Um, next, in that light green, we do have the 0.25 cent sales tax fund. This is where you will see fluctuation in spending, um, and that's really due to that capital expenditure, as Jackson had just explained to you. Um, we also do see an increase in 2023 um, as services were, um, you know, restored for the recreation activity fund, which is the next one in that darker green. So you do see that recovery um, positions were added, services were reinstated, um, and you are seeing higher costs there. Um, the rest of the funds, so our permanent parks and recreation fund, the lottery fund, and then other capital does include the community culture resilience and safety tax or the CCRS um, in that mustardy yellow on the top part um, of the um, staff columns. So we do see that growth at the top of each stack column, you do see a red number, and that is just representative of uh, the total spend for the year. So for 2023, we did spend uh, just slightly over $35 million. 
So would the CCRS be a sixth column on this? CCRS because it's really not dedicated to our department on an annual basis. We don't put it on fund chart. Uh, we do capture it in that month for the other capital so that we have our CCRS funding, um, anything that's coming out of the capital development fund that is dedicated to the department for CIP um, and any other funds that the city has. We capture in that other capital. Are these inflation adjusted numbers? Just raw. Okay. Might be helpful to have a other sources called if you can if that I don't know if that makes sense, but if we did we would probably put it in summary of uses, so just our expense side because I guess from the middle, but we can absolutely get that updated. It just might be helpful. Okay, this next slide uh, shows the uses of funds. Again, we are looking at expenses, um, actuals, not adjusted um, by budget category. So in the 2019 through your 2022, we'll have your actuals. 2023, we'll have an actual, and then we'll be 2023 through budget and 2024 through budget. Um, when we look at this chart, the blue and the green is basically what's consistent with what we consider the operating budget. So that is all the blue is our personnel expenditure, and that lighter green um, right above that is a non-personnel expenditure. So after maintenance, materials, equipment, and such. Um, as we look at the numbers here, we can see that we have increased in spend. Um, we've increased about 3.3 million over 2022. And again, that really has to do with the cost of personnel. And then we are also seeing really inflationary costs hit to the department and we have a lot of contractual services that increase um, that are driving those numbers up. I will see even more as we look to the 2024 approved budget. Uh, that number does go up to 30.1 million for personnel and also for our MPE. Um, as a result of those factors. Um, as we look to the top of the chart, again, you'll see those red numbers, which are the actuals. You'll see this does fluctuate a little bit more when we're looking at the capital and the other capital. Um, and that's really due to our projects. So in 2019, you see there was a lot of capital expenditure that was first got for the pool and the reservoir. Um, in 2020, we uh, did finish those two projects that came in with about 12.1 million capital expenditure. We did drop down during the pandemic on um, that was constrained. And then you'll see for 2023 and 2024, that capital budget does go back up. So for those planned projects that we have, um, and all the capital will be, will be reviewed with the money goal. Questions at all? Okay, moving to the next slide. Um, as previously mentioned, you know, we do spend a lot of time and energy analyzing the recreation activity fund, looking at our fees, our services, levels, and program offerings. And we just uh, do want to obtain that revenue to expense ratio um, balance. And you can see that in 2020, 2023, and in 2024 approved budget. For 2023 actuals, um, as I was mentioned, we did have that strong recovery for indoor recreation coming in at about 22% over 2022 actuals. Um, expense for the RAF did include $600,000 that was slotted uh, for the Flatirons Golf Course Enhancement Project. And that was done basically because they had such a strong 2022 in their revenues. We did allocate some of that funding for that project um, to offset that expense. Um, the alignment you can see across the bottom, that darker gray, is our general fund subsidy, which has really remained pretty flat. Um, over, we did get some one-time infusion during the pandemic. Um, that was at about that $1.6 million. And then we did receive, uh, for the pandemic, some ARPA funding. And that um, is being for 
right. Any questions at all? Slides are really good. All right, so next up we do have 2025, but we'll jump right in. Right into the next year. We always seem this side of the house like to be at least in three years at once. Um, it's, like, it's like great. Mm -hmm. um, but we just wanted to review the 2025 budget strategy goals with you all, and uh, the department is requesting the PRAP's input in the 2025 budget development strategy. Um, we will be looking at some of the 2022 department plan primary policy shifts. Um, we'll be establishing a path forward to developing a physically constrained budget for 2025. We will be bringing to you some updates on the fee policy and the fee schedule, and we will be reviewing with multiple touches in 2025 through 2030 capital improvement program. Um, just a reminder, the PREP does have formal approval for capital expenditures from the Permanent Park and Recreation Fund, um, but then also does play an important advisory role in developing our annual budget, which we appreciate. And just to go over your role for um, budget development, um, you shall make recommendations to council concerning the disposal of park lands, any appropriation or expenditure from the Permanent Park and Recreation Fund, the protection and maintenance of park lands, and you also shall make recommendations to the council concerning the proposed um, department renewal. So in conjunction with citywide goals and initiatives, um, the Boulder Parks and Recreation Department plan serves as our guide for investment and strategies. So as we are looking at 2025 budget development, we want to align and allocate our resources and that support our sustainability, equity, and resilience framework. We want to make sure that we optimize our resources. Um, we will be focused on having a clear focus on our desired outcomes um, and we want to use data. So we want to make data-driven based decisions um, and also use data to measure our uh, outcomes. Um, how our plan fits into all of this is that it will help us achieve a healthy and socially thriving community by developing a budget that focuses money where it will have its most impact. Mm -hmm. so this is the overall strategy with our plan. Next slide, over. And I just wanted to remind the CAB of some um, key policy shifts that did come out of the 2022 department plan. Um, so the first one is that we need to identify additional funding to do additional things, right? So um, expenses need to be offset by revenue. Um, we need to continue to seek alternate funding, such as grants and donations and additional tax subsidy to fund our programs. And we need to look at revenue generation opportunities, um, which may include, but are not limited to adults paying a higher full cost recovery, um, higher non-resident fees, possible commercial uses in parks, and then also exploring other revenue generating opportunities that we have. Um, with no new funding, we do need to reevaluate levels of service to identify community supported reductions. All right, I'm going to step in here. Um, as we start talking about 2025, I think Stacey's laid the good ground as far as where we've been at, um, everything that is getting in our direction. Uh, as Bernie pointed out earlier, the city has identified that we are in a fiscally constrained environment just with flattening of uh, sales and use tax dollars. Um, so we are trying to take a more cautious approach with everything. Um, therefore, we are going to be directing our stable funding towards what is most important. And with that, we rely back on the 2022 department. Um, we will continue to strive to look for other non-traditional funding through grants uh, and fundraising. Uh, but with the dollars that we do receive year over year, we are going to be focusing on those fiscally constrained items. 
um, that are going on on our first facilities and preventive service centers um, in the department plan. So we really view the opportunities as we, next slide, Rosa, sorry. The uh, opportunities as we approach 2025 budget development is we do have a department plan that was unanimously accepted by both the CRAB and City Council and provides very clear direction as far as what we should be doing. Last year, we spent a whole lot of time with you talking about the fee policy and fee schedule, and that has created a good foundation of work to really help us inform how we're budgeting on the revenue side, uh, and that there is consistent definitions um, and types of fees that we are collecting. So we will continue to uh, make some updates to those, but we are talking very minor, minor updates given how recently the fee policy is. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, we have had almost a full recovery from pre-pandemic levels. Um, it's amazing just looking at our usage reports each month and seeing the continued uh, growth across the board. So while I'd love to be optimistic about everything, we do have challenges. Um, and those challenges are the fiscal constrained nature of the city right now. Um, there are multiple city departments competing for a lot of the same uh, pots of money, and at the same time, we do have our own dedicated funds. Those dedicated funds are seeing the same constraints that the citywide funds are. Um, so we will have a fiscally constrained budget. Uh, this really ties back into Chuck's point that uh, inflation is having a big impact on department budgets, um, where the dollars that we spent in 2019 are no longer going as far as they used to. And then you all know that the age of our um, assets are incredibly important to us. Uh, looking at the uh, department plan to compare what we have was one of the top priorities. Um, as one of the themes that we do have a significant list of uh, unfunded capital maintenance, um, as well as underfunded capital maintenance that we'll talk about more next month. We also continue to give the community members that the action and vision level funding is what they're after, um, and that the fiscally constrained is implementing it. So unfortunately, this means saying no to certain priorities or continuing to advocate for additional funding. Going to roll all of this together um, as we focus on the 2025 budget development. We really are looking at realignment of budget. Um, as you saw on the previous slides, there's certain areas where we don't spend our full allocated budget each year, um, and that coincides with staff vacancies, um, underestimating or overestimating of what those expenses are, um, and then just the timing and sequencing of capital projects and when we can get to them. So we do seek to um, really realign budgets across the department in a way that um, continues the investments we have made, but is more realistic with what we're actually spending year over year. Um, as was mentioned, we will continue to focus on non-traditional funding sources. And then what we've heard throughout um, both the department plan update, as well as all of the citywide conversations, is the importance of equitable access to facilities. So that includes maintaining our financial aid and scholarship programs to make sure that we really are focusing on community recreation and that we aren't turning into a private for profit um, recreation center. Uh, next month, we will be hearing more about the CIP. And with that, we are going to do a deep dive on our asset management program for courts to look at um, the various options we have, not just what it costs to replace a court now or build a new court, but also what that court will cost us over 50 years of proactive maintenance. Um, so I look forward to sharing that with you. And then finally, as we are looking towards CAPRA standards, we are going to make sure that all of the budget documents align with the CAPRA standards called out. I'm going to pause there. I flew through 2025. Are there any questions? So what does it mean to realign budgets? Perfect question. Um, Thank you. I'm going to call out our park operations. They budget for six or seven seasonal staff members in each zone every summer. Um, it's been difficult for them to fill more than six positions across the entire work group. Um, but as a result, we have about $150,000 of salary savings for seasonal summer help. Um, can we reallocate that money to go towards contractors to help us with underfunded needs? Is that money better suited elsewhere where there is a greater community need or aspect where we can rely on that staff to make sure that happens? Is that a good enough example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I have a question, and maybe it's a bigger picture question on the term fiscally constrained. Um, I wonder, like, I'm looking at these charts, and you know, it's a pretty strong recovery, and 
we're at a strong lot of economic time and high property values and taxes. And so this is basically constrained like what is like COVID we have another. What is that like maybe maybe we're setting like with those terms while they're useful for planning, like maybe we're setting, you know, really unrealistic expectations for the community. Like it should be called like this is a realistic budget in a strong economy or relatively and so I think that's a long term. But I like I just think that maybe there should be a conversation about that because I think there's this this expectation and people see the numbers and they see their property taxes. Like why don't we have all this and then we call this stuff this way constrained and and it is compared to what we want, but it's really more like this is a, real, a realistic budget, right? And so I don't know how to answer that. It's more like that's a that's something I've thought about throughout this presentation is just that maybe that that those terms and that public facing side of it needs to be re rethought somehow. I fully agree with you. It's been one of my biggest difficulties since I started. Um, it seems as if we have a solid baseline right now, and I view this way constrained as a step below that of what we'll be cut back on. I think part of this comes from the consistent uh, department plan definitions across all departments. This is where the three agreed upon um, financial scenarios that were essentially evaluated. With the shift in the citywide strategic planning, I think that we will see less of these words in the future and more of a, what is our current baseline and minimum level of service that we would offer? What would be nice to add on? Should there be additional funding? And if there were budget reductions, what are we going to have? Perfectly said. The only piece I would add is I recognize in the three, the economy is strong, there are great indicators. Um, our costs are up chasing our revenues. And so inflation, the inflationary impacts on our fleet, on our fuel, on our staffing, all of those things, th those are growing at a faster and greater rate than expenses. So there is, is reason for concern and constraint, but I agree. Current spending, current budget, or current level of service would be a more direct way to call that, that, that existing budget. Yeah, that actually um, segues to my question, which was like, what is the biggest source of, where are we seeing the greatest impacts on an inflation? Is it salaries? Is it materials? Yes. Um, the cost to heat and cool free rest centers to outdoor energy, energy is huge. So energy um, staffing costs. We in the last six years seen the minimum wage go from eleven dollars an hour to fourteen forty two, I believe. Um, and we have very few positions that we're actually paying the minimum wage for. Um, cost of living wage has gone from sixteen dollars an hour in twenty twenty to twenty two forty four an hour now. Um, but all of our contractors that we're relying on for janitorial, landscaping, tree care are all seeing those same growth. So, given the increase in energy costs, have we thought about making investments now in like more solar and renewable technology that could potentially be savings down the line? Are we spending fifty million dollars at the East Berlin Community Center for an energy retrofit? I mean, is that is that part of it? It's going to be Absolutely. renewable. It's the key okay. driver. Yeah. Okay. And is that something we're considering elsewhere in our system to, because I feel like putting some solar panels on some buildings might, I mean, I know it's not that easy, but it might be something we can help offset our energy costs with. Just to connect the dots, because it's great, you weren't here last month, I should send you the PowerPoint. Um, so all of our recreation centers have solar. Any low hanging fruit for any conservation we have achieved. We have daylight occupancy sensors, so lights turn off when it's bright enough in spaces. We have occupancy sensors so that the HVAC doesn't run when the room is on. Okay. We have variable frequency drives on our pool. So, like I went, well, I'll share all of this. And so at this point, we are at the major millions, millions, millions of dollars to make the buildings more energy efficient. It's major envelope, which is the exterior of the building, making it um, more snug so that air doesn't get in and out. Uh, looking at geothermal heat systems so that you can tap into maybe even wastewater heat systems. There's there's technology for that. Well, so, parking lot, uh, solar so cups. We've, we've piloted with some of that. So I guess where I'm going is all of the facility renovations will include energy efficiency okay. as a key goal. Okay. I, think I figured. Just... On top of that, most of our small equipment is now electrical. We are purchasing more and more electric um, vehicles as vehicles come in for replacement. There's certain things that we do that just there won't be an alternative fuel um, solution for the foreseeable future, but 
when there is something that is available, we are trying to swim in that direction. I will add that the average um, park ex outside parking lot stall costs seven thousand dollars to build and five hundred dollars a year to maintain. Plowing, painting, maintenance. Anyway, that all right, so the last thing, we just got two more quick slides. Um, B policy and fee schedule, you all spent a whole lot of time on this last fall. Um, what we have, just as a reminder, um, these are two graphics. The top one is what was in the 2022 permit plan. This shows that for community benefit programs, taxes are the predominant driver of community pays for these, whereas something that it's individual benefits, um, user fees pay for it. So. Um, an example would be uh, our expanded program, uh, taxes paid the majority of that for the general fund subsidy, our uh, softball leagues, um, individual benefits, pay for user fees. So those are full cost recovery. The bottom is just really just a spectrum to show kind of how we categorize that. Um, the higher the cost recovery, it just means it's a more individual benefits um, type of activity. So on the next slide, we had identified 10 different program types with you last year. Uh, two of those really had a lot of significant updates in the 24 fee schedule. Um, there's two more that we promised we would bring back to you this year. So here's our stated intention. We do plan to return to you with commercial use and special events. This may not mirror the budget development process completely, but we are going to um, try to inform our decisions uh, to best project our revenue and impacts associated with it. And then we do have some of the other alternative mechanisms that will be also evaluated through the capital accreditation process. So all that to say, um, we think the fee policy was good work. Um, there is still opportunity for refinance um, based on questions that we've heard from staff, from community members, and we look for any input you have. Um, we aren't looking for major uh, totally rework of the document, but really adding that specific specificity and clarity where um, questions have really come up over the past few months. So I'll pause there for any questions on the fee policy. I'm sure you all have memorized at this point. <laughs> all right, so we did have three questions for you in the packets um, and we'd love for your input on this. Uh, they are listed up on the screen. Staff develop the parameters to guide the budget conversation over the next several months. Is there anything else you would like us to explore? Question two is what information or data does Pratt and YouTube to inform their decision making process as the budget has developed? And three, does the Pratt have any input on the Pratt Star Pay for Fee Policy and Fee Schedule? All So we asked our questions in the middle of those. You guys have great questions. Yes, we went. Are there any wrap up questions? I, I have a question. It's not, it probably goes, there's almost nothing that goes down to the budget process. I'm just going to say it anyway, because I think it is relevant. Is that um, I would love to have a conversation at some point, and maybe again, maybe it's not part of the budgetary, it's good, budgetary process about how we are driving use of regional parks and rest centers. Um, I'll bet there's opportunities to better fund them. And again, I've been spending a lot of time in rest centers and think about this a lot. Um, and he's dropping out of those conversations. Mm -hmm. But you know, we, in Boulder, we have, um, I'll just, just, just rest centers, right? In, in Boulder, we have 24 hour fitness, we have Orange Theory, we have the Alpine Training Center, we have the Y, uh, Colorado Athletic Club. Etc. 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 I don't think that we've clearly articulated to the public what differentiates our facilities and why our facilities are great and worth going to, other than that the city owns them. Um, again, that's not necessarily for a budget process, but I think that's a conversation that's worth having. I think there's a similar conversation to have with the reservoir. Maybe the golf course. Couldn't agree more. Okay. I, I'm looking to Scott because what you just outlined is work that is on the work plan for 2024 around a marketing plan, around a business plan for the reservoirs. It, it's a gap. Okay. Well, good. Well, I hope that you'll buff wrap as appropriate. Absolutely. So. 
And maybe consider you a marketing professional. We should invite you. I do that all day. That was as a consultant. That sounds great. We cannot consult with you as a marketing professional. And that would be a conflict of interest. You can resign your seat and then. <laughs> I think with that, staff looks at everything the revenue and expenses by each of our program areas, the registration periods. Is it a fall class? Is it a spring class? So we do a lot of that data analysis on the back end, but then how we translate that into marketing and driving the visitation of these facilities. Um, I think that something we're really good at is looking backwards. It's right. not necessarily looking ahead of where we want to be and how we want to get there. Right. Um, so we will definitely take that feedback and I'm going to rely on Scott's expertise here. So thank you for bringing it up. Thanks for the resignation. I would like to say that at my last private meeting, it's a pleasure to hear both Stacy and Jackson give a budget presentation because you guys are always so clear and so concise. So you know every answer to every question we have. It's really a pleasure. So thank you for being with us. You good in the bad. What's your question? Seriously, who's stepping up? No, not. There was yeah. going to be another step up. Jack's question. <laughs> <laughs> what about Sunny? Sunny, do you have any questions or anything to add? Nothing at this time. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. We'll move on to matters from the board. And the first item I suggest that we discuss. The item that was added at the beginning of the agenda setting, and that is uh, the city council meeting on April 11th that will consider the historic designation of the civic area around the, uh, which we discussed two months ago. Um, the suggestion was made that someone be available from, um, from Crab and Plan Board and possibly from Landmarks. Is that what you have? be able to answer questions the city council might have about the board opinions and i won't be on the board at that time and i think i'll be on a plane to austria so um someone other than me needs to do this that's an evening was that that's a regular evening meeting it's a regular evening yes i, I can volunteer unless yeah. somebody else wants to no go for it i was going to volunteer you anyway <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'll just note on behalf of staff that the the when you speak on behalf of the board, it would be to those board talking points of referendum discussion. And if you were to speak to your own, you would have to clarify that you were speaking as for a community member versus for a And it's helpful to review the minutes and uh, also the video if you want clarification on what our opinions are. So you can represent that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was um, okay, uh, matters from the board, Pratt Matters. So this is an opportunity to relay any questions you have from the community, any concerns that are appropriate for this scale of discussion. Um, I just wanted to say I was at uh, uh, Vealey Lake sledding yesterday with my kids, and I was there for two and a half hours, and the entire time there were people from I think it was either staff or volunteers from the department shoveling the tennis courts at South Rep. Yeah. And it was like just amazing to watch because it really, having recently been doing a lot of shoveling of heavy snow, I was just amazed by how dedicated they were and how long it took. And just everybody seemed to have a smile on their face. And I think it was a really positive reflection of the, the department. So. It's the partnership of both of the ball. They organize it. They have a person at North and a person at South who organizes to clean up, make sure they use plastic shovels that don't damage the court. And they really own it. And it's a great job. Yeah, they were very, they seemed intent on getting it cleaned up and ready to go for pickleball. So. And Bernie, did you have a meeting with the tennis and pickleball folks? Uh, I missed the last game. Okay. But we saw the presentation tonight. Right. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Then we have crab recruitment, orientation, and departing members. This is historically a moment where if any members of the board want to offer anything to our departing members, you can do so. We also have gifts that we have given to Jason and Chuck to recognize their service. We're incredibly grateful. Um, I'll say out loud just on behalf of our team that 
both of you in different ways. It's just amazing to look at the span of work that you have been a part of in your time on Crab. Um, Chuck in five years, and then Jason, and you came on on board. I think just started having meetings in person in the last however many months, which is just mind boggling a little bit when you look at what that means as a board member. I remember meeting you in person for the first time. We knew each other for like three years. It was like, oh, nice to finally shake your hand. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I was just struck in looking at these graphics. If you look at the significant revenue reduction in 2020 and 21, I just called them. I mean, I know they were our hardest years, and, and you guys were right there with us. In supporting the hard choices and supporting the team and, and we're incredibly grateful you both left your mark on the community um and the facilities that you helped open i treasure those pictures from both of us warren scott carpenter in your support but also to you both i people always ask about what what is being a board member and i think i've told you, each of you to me it's it's someone who is going to ask us really great questions to make the work better in a way that recognizes where people who care on our public services we both and we're very grateful Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I've absolutely enjoyed my time on the board. Um, when I first started on the board, I looked at parks in a whole new light. Like I had this sense of pride and ownership. It was like, I'm responsible for that, you know, at some level. But it was really a great feeling. And that's maintained all the way through my tenure. And so I, I learned a lot about the parks department. Uh, it's the best run department in the city by far, in my opinion. You have great staff, great leadership. Um, everyone seems to enjoy their work, which is a key part of being good at your job, I think. So um, I, I've learned so much about the city and, and how it works, and uh, it's just been a great, really great process. The whole thing. Can't think of anything bad about it. Some meetings are kind of usually the P the P word means prairie dogs. <laughs> yeah. I only had one meeting with prairie dogs for discuss. That was a long last year. Yeah. Well, I hate to follow Chuck, but I, I have you know, share the same sentiment. Actually, I think about this a lot because Terry and I go on these uh, our interviews were a year of 2020. Uh, and I've told this before, but I remember going to the interview city council. You go to like shake some guy's hand and he looked at me like, you know, like what, what are you doing? And I was like, what's wrong with you? This is like there's two cases in Seattle and and then a few weeks later, you know, got the good news, we got appointed to Crab and then you know we saw each other in person for more than two years and just met Chuck maybe two years ago. Um, but it's you know, as Chuck said, it's just been it is the best board. Um I told people it's you, know, you get to work on great issues and you don't lose friendships in the city because you're um, not if you're working on tough important issues but not um, not divisive issues so you're not working on divisive uh, but I've been just so impressed with the staff and how the leadership and uh, I think we're all lucky to have you know city staff like this um, we all benefit from your expertise and the dedication. Uh, but yeah, it's, I just uh, that's been the big takeaway is just how impressive uh, the people that work in this department and the city are. I think um, I wish more people do that. So um, yeah, thank you for for this experience. It's been a great group. It's going to be a great group going forward. I'm excited to read the numbers. And I'm thinking back to some of the people I've served with, with Tara and Larry Scott and and, 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 uh, and Raj. And, uh, it's been a really great group of people. So. Experience. Well, I'd like to say a couple of words to you guys. So, um, Chuck, start with you. It's been an absolute pleasure to serve with you, um, my time on the board. And I think you're an incredibly good leader. You run the meetings super efficiently. You're very fair with everybody, and you treat everybody from board members to staff to the public with a lot of respect. And I think that that's some, it's often challenging um, when you're trying to run a meeting, and there are a lot of interesting personalities. But uh, I, I really think that you you have done all those things perfectly. And uh, I know everybody in the room thinks this, but you you're definitely the most thoughtful and prepared member of the board. I mean, like you 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 definitely closely read the packets um, at a level that um, I know I think all of us would aspire to. Um, and we really appreciate the questions you bring and. Every time you ask a question, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a good question. I should have seen that, you know. Um, but really appreciate how much energy you brought to the, the role. 
because it's a volunteer job and you you clearly have prepared for every meeting uh, extensively. And then I really appreciate how you you're very committed to the environment and the climate, and you live that. You know, you ride your bike to every meeting, and you probably ride your bike everywhere you go in Boulder, um, which is really awesome to see. And as an homage to that, I rode my bike from South Boulder. Then now it's an electric bike. I'm not as hardcore as that. Okay, but. Uh, I, I definitely I, I wanted to make sure that I, I, I at least tried to emulate you for one meeting uh, to this building, um, but I've always admired that, and uh, it's really been great to serve with you. And please stay in touch. And if I if I have questions for you, please pick up the phone. <laughs> you'll, you'll be getting a donation from me once I get off the phone. Yay! <laughs> Thanks a lot. Of course. And then Jason. Um, so I. <laughs> I was thinking back on this. I met you 20 years ago, almost to the day. Um, you were, I was a snot-nosed first-year teacher. And you were a snot-nosed uh, education policy director for Senator Harry Reid. It was in some over-air conditioned room in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, but yeah, and we, so we struck up a friendship. We both ended up pursuing careers in education in some way. You in policy and me in like whatever else I've been doing, law. Um, and it's so great that we got to reconnect in Boulder when we moved back here and that we have kids who are basically the same age and are on soccer teams and basketball teams. And, um, you are, you're the reason I'm here because I called you one day and I was like, Hey, I think I want to get involved in the city more. And you were like, Hey, I'm on this thing called the crab. You should check it out. And so, um, I did and here I am. And, um, so really grateful for that. And it's been awesome to serve with you and, uh, we're all really sad you're leaving uh, the crowd. You've been an amazing member. You asked the, the questions that I wish I had. I didn't know I had, but then when you ask them, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that also was, that was a question I should have had as well. Um, but I think that that just reflects how uh, you've been in some really important meetings and rooms in your career, like in Congress and in the Senate, and that shows in your work on this board. I mean, like you bring such a lens, like an amazing lens to every policy issue that I, I really would like to emulate more. Um, but excited for your next chapter and we're going to go see now. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, I didn't prepare anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. I'm sorry that our kind of work got short, but um, I definitely would love to meet you with you. And uh, I talk, I'll do my best to carry forward for all the meetings most of my allows. <laughs> Excellent. And bring a parking lot for you too. I will bring a parking lot for you too. I didn't end it today for the same reason. I don't think I see me out there. But... <laughs> it's it's right. Right. Get out of the door. It's 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 fall in my hand. <laughs> yes, I second what you both stated that I have a lot to do and I really respect both of you and your minds and what you bring to the board and across the board. I know you work on two business meetings and two different meetings as a concerned citizen of Boulder. Right. So, well, my next chapter is. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just really sorry I wasn't there to be there with you guys and say, you know, give you both a hug and say thank you. But I just want you to know it's been a pleasure getting to know you through this medium and I'm really gonna miss seeing you guys and miss hearing your insights into these questions that we're all exploring together. And I'm I'm excited to continue to stay connected with you and your work through play and the school board. And I just wish you the best. I look forward to seeing you guys around town. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Tom. My pleasure to you. <laughs> yeah, what's in the packages, guys? I feel like the picture thing. Oh, that's nice. I think they're my favorite part. Uh, no, the North Boulder part. Yes, they're my favorite part. Oh, that's beautiful. Nice. Great. Thank you very much. What does it say? What's the inscription? 
its appreciation for serving on the prep. Okay. And how these come about is we ask the members, uh, what is your favorite park? And so then I go and source a picture and we get that frame for them. That's right. Who took the photos? Uh, they were in Jonathan Thornton's library. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Can I ask about the, the newbies? What are their names? And yeah, what are their names? Yeah, let me grab. I think list. I know two of them. I, I know three of the names. I just am going to grab the details for you from this morning's meeting where we talked about it. So um the uh, here it is the five-term seat chuck's expired term is um, being filled by jenny robbins the three years term that is finishing anita spears term is filled by wayland lewis the one-year term that is finishing hunger's term is eric rapine eric rapine he's great he's you don't yeah and i met him through it's like yeah, really good guy, super nice. I think all three are going to be yeah. really helpful on the board and the work that we have next. Um, will Waylon and Eric have the opportunity to stay on if they want to serve full term? It's really the city council's purview. Mm -hmm. They and I they talked about this. There's been appointments like so for someone who just serves a one year term, they often are afforded the opportunity to serve a full year term, and it really just depends on any given year the. Council pays attention to lots of factors. They pay attention to geographic distribution, gender distribution. Mm -hmm. um, they do. They do think about again unfinished terms. If someone just had a one year term, that that person often can get another term. But it really depends. I think that Thursday night they said several times what an embarrassment of riches that were for several boards, including this one. That it was for, there were hard choices to make, which is where we want to be. And so at the next regular meeting, at the beginning of the meeting, they'll be sworn in, right? Yeah, let's go back to the agenda because there's a few things around process stuff that we need okay. to make sure you guys talk about. Let's go. Oh, select okay. Is that a touch team? That is. Oh, that's it's it's not, remote. It's TV remote. There are some logistics about their onboarding that I think are on your matters for the board. Oh, oh, I don't know. It's 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 it. It. Oh. <laughs> it's still on Rose's Basically. computer. Sunny will be back in a moment. <laughs> um, if we want to go back to your agenda for a moment, there were a few items and matters from the board around. Kind of recruitment orientation. Yeah, because we have to swear it in before we select the officers. That correct. Oh, thank you. Scott's got it up. Um, so one, and I think it's in the actual matters from the department. Rosa, I believe, had pasted in. So what are we looking for? The details on the chair and vice chair recruitment and what that typically looks like. Okay, so, so uh, Elliot, yeah. do you want to chime in? Yeah. Elliot so, and I talked earlier yeah. today. So um, Rosa and I chatted about this earlier, but for the remaining members, uh, so Sunny listening in, uh, Rose is going to send us an email soon that will address uh, nominations for chair and vice chair. So people can nominate others, they can self-nominate, and then she's going to compile that information and then send it to everybody before the next meeting to say who's been nominated and for what positions. And then we'll use that info as a launching point for the elections. So that's the first thing that we're going to start with is uh, so-and-so is nominated as chair. Uh, do we have a vote for yes? So-and-so is nominated for vice chair. Do we have a vote for yes? And then, um, and so that new person would start the meeting on April 22nd. And this is all preceded by swearing in of the new members mm -hmm. so that they can vote. Exactly, yep. So that's so also, as far as the new folks, Rosa and I will be reaching. They'll get a city onboarding about being a board member that you all might remember. They'll get a department onboarding that will include this financial presentation, recognizing your guiding and during budget session. And then I believe you all typically assign, and it, that can be on the agenda for your April meeting, you assign the new folks a, a prep mentor, someone they can have on task when they're reading the packet and like, what's this? 
Can you give them a copy of the handbook too? Yes, mm -hmm. Thanks. absolutely. And so, uh, Elliot, what I'm going to do is go back to uh, April of 2023 and, and just emulate everything that we did there uh, for the for the PAD members. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then um, as well, we now that we have three new PAD members, we're going to send out um, uh, a poll to see when in May uh, you would like your May meeting. What would you do to normal? Uh, so the fourth Monday of May is the holiday. Ah. Yeah. So. That's Memorial Day. Yep. So lots on the agenda for April twenty second, and so. Um, I'll make a suggestion. I, I think we should not have a poll. I think we should say it's going to be the Monday before that. May twentieth. We can do that. We can do that. I left yeah. the room, so she can put the if, if you all agree on that, we Anna, would you love that. The main meeting, would you be okay if we move the meeting up a week to work more than all? Sure. Okay. There you go. Yeah, okay. and I, I think that was going to be the, I blocked that day off anyway. So, okay. And so, Elliot, you are the only one with us at the PREP agenda sitting meeting this Thursday. Are you, you're still on the board until the end of March, right? I'm still on, but I will not be in town. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Does anyone else like to participate? Yeah. Does anybody else want to join? Uh, it's typically at 245, 145. Yeah. It's this it's virtual. It's, I'm sorry, is this Thursday? Or yeah. This Thursday? Mm -hmm. It's to set the agenda for the next meeting. It's virtual. It lasts 15, 20 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, I have a topic for that time. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. okay. And I need to. Um, for that. Yeah, and that what it was just something we we're going to discuss today to make sure we had somebody. I will throw up. Sonia, if you want to partic participate in the agenda setting meeting, you're welcome to as well. I won't be able to make that date, but thank you. Okay. Up to you, Elliot. Really. I'll just go solo. Sorry about that. So that's okay. It's an interesting process. Okay, anything else on the chair and vice chair selection process? Okay, so the final item on the agenda is the finalization of the city council letter. So we have a draft letter that's been circulated. I hope everyone has had time to look at it. And uh, thank you very much to Anna and Bernie for putting it together. Yeah, and it all here. Thanks to you both for putting it together. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of items that need to be filled in. One is the actual number, right? The actual, uh, work, there's a spot for requesting funds. Uh, where did that go? Do you already filled in? I thought there was an XXX blank somewhere. There probably, I believe it's the rec center, rec center section. Or a name of terms. And so, that's the second. I essentially they gave us some numbers for any request for some additional data from the staff to provide it with them. Okay, so it's already been filled in? Yeah. Okay, I did find one issue on the top of the third page, or right after the chart. There's another page that follows, and that just starts in the middle of a sentence. Like you lost a piece of a sentence somewhere when you paste it in the graphics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because also means that the city's pool of potential lifeguards is not only large or diverse as people. So if that could be corrected, that would be fabulous. <laughs> and then the date needs to be filled in. That's obvious. But I thought that this was sorry. I'm sorry. Just yeah. to go back to that. I thought um, it should read. I'll just read the sentence aloud. Make sure no one is okay with it. Uh, it should read, not only does this put marginalized children at increased risk of drowning, but it also limits their access to exercise and recreation, 
It also means that the city's pool of potential life parks is not as large or, or diverse as it could be. First part of the sentence is missing. Well, the first sentence is two years, almost two sentences. Um, okay, so we'll. Rose, we'll just send you a new. Okay? Yeah, I need a uh, before March 22nd. Which, I can do it right now. Yeah, but, or, and don't worry about it. You can send it to me in the morning, tomorrow afternoon. Okay. I'm just saying, I just need it before the It looks like it's still the same. It's yeah. the so it's just. It is, I think, it's just copying it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's a technical edit issue. Yeah. Um, I, I did want to say that I, I really like the letter because I feel like it, it puts out in front exactly what we're asking for, right? These are the three issues. And then you have in detail what, why we're asking for it and how much and what the needs are. And so I really like having that broken into the two pieces that puts the request right at the front. And then for those who want to dive into the details, the details all here, three footnotes and everything. So. I, I think you did a really nice job, a very impressive job of putting together all the information, the data, the graphics. It's a, it's a lot to read, but I think it's because because of the way it's split up, it's not going to be too much to ask of the city council members to read the main request and then look at the details if they want to. Yeah, I thought the inclusion of charts was really, really smart. That really was a lot. <laughs> It's not the not only just like making you know, here's what we hope, but all this, all the data and all the stats and whatever peer, like, you know, peer city, but what New York City is doing, that it's was really well done. So, yeah, I think thank you very much. For that. Tony, do you have any comments on the letter? No. And tell us the end of the meeting. Great. Okay. Um, last item is the next board meeting, April 22nd, which will be here again because. I have reserved Brenton. We all think it works. This is great. It's yeah. Great. It's I think fixing the microphone issue would probably be uh, Yep, I put in a service request. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, can I have a motion then to adjourn the meeting? I'll switch the motion. Second. 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 We got four seconds. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.